Trash. Trash. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the We Speak English Good podcast. Today's guest is Mr. Cornelius Mims, or Corny Mims, but I refer to him as Mr. Mims throughout the entire podcast. Uh, I don't address him uh, informally once. Uh, I'm not sure why, but probably because he has credits like uh, he's on the Bad Album, uh, Michael Jackson, you might have heard of him. <laughs> that was stupid. Sorry, guys. Uh, he's worked with Quincy Jones. He was uh, a musical director for Death Row Records. So if you guys listened to T-Money Green a couple years ago for the 100th episode, uh, T-Money Green was with Death Row right before Cor- uh, Corny comes in. So uh, Corny comes in through DJ Quick, which you'll hear all about this, but he has credits for Tupac. All eyes on me, all over that base, all over all eyes on me. So, um, legend, and that he doesn't even stop there. He's worked with Grover Washington Jr., uh, Layla Hathaway. Come on, what 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 else we got here? I'm just going through the Brian McKnight. Uh, our uh, oh, fucking uh, just recently he won a. a Never mind. I, I can't. I can't even. T- it's it's all in the podcast. Okay, it's all in the podcast. I mean, he's worked with the fantastic Negrito. I mean, so he has just been a, had a very blessed career, and it was a true honor to talk to a vet like the like like this guy. And and he's so fucking funny. Anyways, we, we're gonna get to that. But first, uh, why don't you go to randommystique.com, R E I N A. M Y S T I Q U E dot com and check out the new album 1018. I had the honor of penning a couple of the tunes uh, alongside my beautiful and gorgeous and and just wonderful wife, Raina Mystique. And uh, we really love the album and we want you guys to check it out too. So go check it out 1018. You can find it on Spotify or anywhere we play. Which, if you just click on the experience tab at randommystique.com, you can see where we are playing as an acoustic duo slash band sometimes. Uh, and, <laughs> and then, uh, while you're on the internet surfing around, you might as well stop by the newly redesigned we speak English Good dot net. Uh, there you'll find all kinds of crazy, cool, fun things the, that's related to the podcast follow me on instagram at we speak english good uh you can write the show at we speak english oh my god come on now come on let's get it together here (laughs) we speak at we speak english good at gmail.com that's how you can write the show and 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 please do tell me what you think tell me what you thought of this episode i'd love to hear your thoughts um and let's see what else is there oh yeah you can leave a review for us on itunes we speak english good that helps anywhere you get your podcast you leave a review or share the podcast or talk about the podcast on your podcast i don't know (laughs) that's what sam harris says uh but yeah that that's about that so uh real quick before we jump in which we are going to jump in right after i get done saying this next thing i just want to let you guys know that i did have some technical issues on this um this particular podcast which is just heartbreaking but i just want to let you know there's some weird cuts in here and just know that it's just because i'm using uh, i'll explain more after the podcast so if you guys want to hear more about why i suck (laughs) you can you could uh you could uh tune in after the podcast and check it out uh but now for now uh let's please uh, i am so honored to introduce this next guest uh mr cornelius mims hey man let me ask you a question sure is it we all speak English? Oh no, no! It's we speak English good. It's uh, we speak English good. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a uh, it's a ridiculous name, um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Explain it to me. <laughs> oh sure. Well, um, me and my friend at the time I was in a hip hop group, and uh, me and one of the MCs decided to uh, start a podcast. 
and we were sitting around and there was lots of weed involved and i just right, of i thought I, of course and i thought that um uh, like i had thought of this it was a joke at first it was actually a joke that i thought was stupid and funny we speak english good because uh grammatically that is incorrect and so it's sort of like an ironic stupid thing so that was the joke and i just threw it out there and he was like okay and then he made the website and and that's about that that's the boring story behind that (laughs) it's a funny thing man what happens when you get marijuana involved in the creative process yeah i was just telling him well well just tell my fiance about a moment when I was with Tupac, Tupac and, and, and Snoop, mm. well, and there was a lot of weed going around, and we were working on a song called um, All About You. Yeah, a right? classic, classic song. Classic song. Yes. But, you know, um, every other video, no matter where I go, I see the same. Yeah. <laughs> That ain't nothing but weed, man. <laughs> I, I watched it, man. I watched it, man. We were all sitting up. We were working. I was, I was, I was tracking bass, and uh, you know, two, you know, it was just about thirty or forty blunts going around simultaneously. You know. Yeah. And there was the TV was on, and CNN was on, and as the as the the marijuana effect kicked in harder. And the TV was going. That's just kind of how. That's the stupidest hook. <laughs> but stupidest hook. But that's what ended up happening. Yeah. <laughs> that, as a result, of, as a result of sitting around smoking weed and in, in, in the studio. And, and so and so they were just watching CNN, and it just came to them. With the say it again, man. Oh no! Well, you you were saying that they they were just watching CNN and watching the march, and then CNN happened to be on the TV yeah. in the studio. Um, I think at that time it was this thing called the Million Man March. Oh yeah, yeah, in DC. Right, right in DC. So they were talking about that, and Snoop literally looked up on the screen and saw a girl that was happened to be at the march <laughs> that was in one of the videos. <laughs> <laughs> and he had just girl. seen the girl not recently on a, on a video shoot together. Wow, and and, and yeah. they just came out of that. It, it's funny people will smoke and weed. Out of that, yeah, yeah that, that 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 that's the look. Yeah, well, people will smoke weed, and then uh, the problem is, like, sometimes you get, like, really good ideas. I mean, because that became a hit, obviously, but, like, some Absolutely. people have, like... Some good ideas, yeah. <laughs> but then people go with bad ideas when they smoke weed, and then that can be disastrous. Absolutely, and, 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 and they think they're good. Right, exactly. The weed is telling them, like, yeah, that's cool. The weed has, has clouded their judgment. And convinced him that this idea is good, <laughs> and you know, in in actuality, it's to the contrary. <laughs> so um, you know, well, I want to that word. Well, I'd like to back up a bit and uh, and kind of start from the beginning. I know I, I, the the show is mostly con- uh, conversational, but I, I like to I like to delve in and find out a little bit about your past. So I was just curious, uh, where where were you born? Where you come from? I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, man. Oh, nice. L.A. cat. Okay, yeah. okay. And, then, and yeah. then, So do you have like a lineage of music in your family? Not really. Not a, not, not a lineage like, you know, like like my father and, you know, and then our siblings or, you know, n- nothing like that. I'm pretty much the lone musician, music person. I mean, I'm talking about that that really, really excelled at it. You uh, know? Yeah, professionally. Yeah, probably, yeah, and and went to 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 the professional level with it. So you did have you music know? in your family. It's just yeah, they were around. Uh, definitely, my mom's side is a musical. You know, my mother and my grandparents were ministers, mm. and so my mom and her sibling. You know, there's a large, large. Um, uh, uh, she, my mom has a bunch of brothers and sisters. And they basically all kind of were kind of in church. All, they grew up in church. And they were basically, since my grandfather was like the pastor of the church, the, they were, my my mom and her siblings were his choir. Mm. 
Okay, okay. So she she sang. Well, up, so, of, oh, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. She and her sisters and brothers. You know, they were they. You know, so they and they they are musical. Mm-hmm. And I've got a couple of aunts that play piano, and you know, so you know, I kind of had music around as a kid. You know, by way of my mom, and you know that that was that was the inspiration initially. I see. I see. So did you come up in the church as well? You know what? Kind of, kind of, you know, I was, we always went to church. We weren't like really, really super immersed in it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, there's different degrees of coming up in the church. Yeah. You know, some people, you know, what I meant musically and not, not really like, yeah, I mean, I meant musically, not like spiritually or whatever, but. Right, 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 right. Uh No, musically, man. Like I'm more into the church now. Oh, and I've been more into the church as an adult, mm. musically, yeah, and into gospel music, right? You know the whole gospel music vibe and the scene. I didn't really get into it until more, you know, uh, in my adult years, and and you know, even a little later on in my career. I see. So then, you know what? So then, how did you get a bass in your hand? Like what? What drew you to the bass? Well, the bass man was. Um, it was a kind of a, 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 a series of um, different instrument instrument instrumentation morphs as a kid, you know. Like every other month or so, I'd kind of just decide I wanted to, I want to play something else, you know. I'd go to my dad, look, Dad, I want to play trumpet. He'll buy me a trumpet, I'll master that. And then, okay, Dad, I'm done, I want to play guitar. Get the guitar, master that. Okay, Dad, I want to switch over to, so he kept doing it, you know. I kept, you know, changing up as a kid you know, trying and, and learning the instruments, you know, getting pretty good and then getting kind of bored. Mm. So it, it wasn't until I got around 13 years old, I've, you know, and after a bunch of different instruments, my father had already, you know, bought into, like I told him, I, you know, I, I got wind of the bass guitar by way of a, a, a concert that I went to. I mean, I went to a Jackson five concert. It was Michael, Michael Jackson and the brothers and, in LA. And, um, I don't know, you know, we were sitting in the nosebleed section, the way up high, me and my younger sister. And as we were scanning the line, you know, the, of the brothers, what I, what stood out to me and it looked cool to me, not so much was Michael, but Jermaine. And, I, and, and at that point, I didn't understand. I didn't even know what he was doing. I didn't know what instrument he played. He just had a very cool vibe to me. Mm a cooler vibe than anybody else. Yeah. So, so oh, go ahead. after, after the, after the concert, I did a little investigation to find out that he was the bass player. You know, that was what the instrument he was playing. And I just decided, man, okay, that looks cool. And I want to do that. So I, I went to my dad to tell him, Hey dad, listen, you know, um, it, it looks like, you know, I, I need to switch over to bass. And he was like, oh, no way. No way, man. You got drums and you got drums and trumpets and accordions and guitars and trombones. And you got every instrument in the music store under your band already. <laughs> I'm not buying you the bass. No way. No way, man. No way. So it took about a year and a half of begging. Almost daily, you know. So yeah, I know I was fourteen or so when he finally got he just broke. I broke him down finally. It took a good year, year and a half to get him to got, kind of break down and buy the first base. But um, he ended up doing that for me. You know, I was I think eighth grade. I got that, and I have never put it down. <laughs> well, that's very apparent. Uh, so, from then to now, yeah, yeah, so, it's amazing. So I was curious. So, did you take formal lessons, or were you uh, were you self taught? Like, how did you? What was your experience in training? You know what? There's no, you know, my training. I w- wouldn't say self taught. No, mm. Not, you know, I mean, I was taught by, and, and then it, I wouldn't call it formal. I call it, it would be more informal as opposed to formal as mm. far as bass goes. I took formal piano. Mm. Be- but this is before bass. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. um, once I started playing bass, you know, a lot of it, you know, was, you know, you just kind of 
listen and you you hook up with other guys and you watch and you you know you live and that's all kind of like you, you you're training yeah you know, you just kind of get in different scenarios you work out with different musicians different guys and then as a kid in, in LA at that time which it was the mid 70s and late mid into the late 70s was my you know high school years you know middle, junior and, and 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 junior high and high school years were mid to late to the, to the end of the 70s mm. in Los Angeles it's an extremely great time to be a young kid that aspired to play music because it was very very um supported oh and encouraged and you know there were a lot of kids that were very you know in what ways good at music it, you know in what ways were you guys encouraged uh young musicians well, I mean, you know, it was just a, a good fit. it was a good um um activity you mm-hmm. know for a kid you know i mean it kept kid kept you involved it kept you yes. you know and, and it, it, it even united kids you know of right. different ethnicities and different neighborhoods, you know, we could all come together and, you know, hey, respect and, you know, get down together. Yeah, totally. You know? Yeah. And, yeah, and it it really, really united, you know, from one school to the next, you know. Mm. You know, hey, there were kids that went to all the different, you know, our schools were rivals, but we were in the same bands together. Yeah. You know, yeah. although, you know, our neighborhoods may be rivals, <laughs> but man, as far as us, we didn't see that. You know, we were like, man, that dude can play. Right, right. Yeah. And he lives in that neighborhood, so man, it's all good. You were pretty young when you kind of got your first break, correct? I would say, you talk about pro- professional break? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I was fresh out of high school mm. when it first when it first kicked in for me. You know, my very first, um, you know, um, professional um, opportunity. I was nothing 19. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Oh, my God. 19. <laughs> my, you know, the first major label um, recording project that I played bass on. You know, I mean, and to hear myself on the radio, you know. Yeah. To hear, to hear something that I'm actually on, 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 on the radio. Yeah, I'm sure that's exciting. Yeah, who who I, was that I, with? That, that, yeah, that happened in 19. Uh, who was who was that with that you started playing that with? That was an act. I don't know, man. Um, you may remember this act. These guys. This is a. It was a duo. It was a male female duo called Peaches and Herb. Oh, absolutely. Uh, they do shake your groove thing, right? Is that them? Shake your groove thing. Yeah. Yep, same album. Oh yeah! Oh, same God. album as Fifty Years Thing. They're amazing. Yeah, yes, so, that's mean, amazing. Yeah, Fifty Years Thing reunited. Yeah, reunited. You know, and, yeah, and I yeah. played on a track. I played, yeah, I played on a track on that album. Oh, rock and roll! Hell yeah! Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I was fresh out of high school. Now at the time, you know. Now at the time, were you touring? Were you just a studio musician? Uh, what was the capacity you were working in at this time? You know what, man? It, it, you know, it was then as it is even now, man. It was a, it was everything. Oh, okay, yeah. I tu- I, 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 right now, I tour, I play live, I record, I musical direct. You know, it's like whatever and everything that you can kind of tie yourself into, you do. Yeah. And as, even as a kid, man, you know, I was able to, you know, we were doing um studio stuff. You know, we were in the studio. We were in the on on stage, you know, kind of doing 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 it all. Right on, yeah. I mean, doing like, it all. I, I think that's kind of like how it goes for everybody, right? Like you kind of, if you're going to be a musician, especially nowadays, I feel like you got to even be more than a musician. Like I do photography and filmography too, on top of music right. and on top of recording and all that. Right. Uh, it's just gotten crazier. Yeah. But uh, I feel like that's like a valuable piece of information for people to know is that uh, if you're going to be a musician. Uh, I mean, there are studio cats. There are people who just tour and stuff. But like, if you right. want to be yeah, a yeah, well-rounded, that, yeah, that that. Are, but you know, they they are two different, two totally different disciplines. Totally. That you know, um, 
I guess I would say, you know, when, when it comes, as far as a musician, to be a studio guy versus a live guy. Yeah. You know, there is a, there's a discipline to being a studio guy. That that applies in studio that doesn't necessarily apply in on stage and vice versa, mm. and you know there 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 are definite differences. Like yeah. to me, I know guys that I would call for a live gig in a heartbeat that I wouldn't use in the studio. Hmm. That's interesting. And vice versa. Yeah. And vice yeah. versa. That's the guys that I would you know definitely call to record because they've got that discipline. But as far as the ability to stretch out and you know, or adapt to different music um, scenarios because that's the main thing when it comes to the live element. You know, you have to be ready for any look that comes at you, Mm -hmm. you know, and look can change, you know, within a gig or from gig to gig. Absolutely. You know, you can be on, it can be a totally different vibe, you know, from one gig to the next. And that's all something that I've always prided myself on. I've always tried to be a guy that, came off authentic. Like if it's a rock thing, if I'm playing rock, man, I don't want to sound like a brother that a funk dude trying or attempting to play rock. Yeah. You know, or vice versa or a jazz dude that's attempting to play, you know, but his real, you know, his real prowess is, but he's, you know, like I always try to really come off as authentic, no matter what the vibe or the genre is, Mm -hmm. you know, so if it's funk, man, I'm that dude. Oh, yeah. And if it's rock, man, I'm smashing the shit out of it. <laughs> you know, as a, rock, as a rock cat would do, but mm. it's going to have a funkiness about it mm. at yeah. the same time. Or yeah. jazz, you know. I mean, hey, I really want to come off with that, you know, independence of a real guy, you know, that, that really comes from that. You know, so, you know, and that's the thing about live. And then you also need to have that kind of adaptability in the studio as well. Because, I mean, I've played, it's been some of everything right. that's, that I've been doing it with uh, as far as vibe. And I have to say, I would like to think I, that there's nothing that really came at me that I just, you know, did not, you know, cut it. Yeah. Yeah, man. I sure. can't think of anything. Yeah, over man. a long period of time, I can't think of anything that I just oh man, I just did not. Man, I dropped the ball. I did, I, you know, I can't think of anything that presented that sort of a challenge to me. That that's that's an awesome thing to be able to say because I know there's things out there yeah. that I'm just like, oof, <laughs> I don't know what was going yeah, on. Yeah, that that's day. above. That's above. You know, now, I've had some things that really. Yeah, I've had to fucking you know, you know, really buckle down and really work it up. You know, and but you know, my thing is I'm a little too prideful. <laughs> mm, yeah. No, no, no. I feel you. I'm man. a little too prideful, man. I feel it's it, like if it's a fucking challenge, if it's really a challenge, oh my god, let's go, let's go. It's like anything, man. If if you put it in front of me, and if it really, you know, I, I'm almost insulted by it. <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> You mean to be, wow, my God. You really going to come at me like that? I mean, in other words, it's almost like, you know, like if you're in a fight or something. Yeah. And you really got to, you really got to approach the thing with everything you got. You know what I mean? I've had a couple of gigs that kind of put me in that place, man. I had to really study. I had to really, I mean, and, you know, dexterity wise, you know, some hard shit. Yeah. You know, difficult lines, difficult, you know, difficult things, you know, difficult, difficult music. Right, right. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, and, you, know, you need that, man. It's that, it's great because, you know, everything has been so effortless over the course of my life. I mean, for as far as I can recall, music, just about every, anything. I mean, as a kid, even in, you know, orchestra and marching band and stuff, you know, all that stuff was so easy to me. Everything came so easy and so natural. So that's when that's why I really appreciate something that really kicks my ass and 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 makes me, you know, you know, really really works me out. Yeah, man. Because like I feel like you need that for growth. Like you you can get stagnant. You gotta have it, man. It's imperative. You you'll never grow. Right. You, you know you'll never grow if you don't have anything like that. You know. 
Yeah, man. It, and um, it's funny. I tell you what, where I've been getting my ass kicked more so. Like I play, I play, I play at my church, right? Yeah. And the the youngsters in gospel music now are really coming with some crazy, Ooh. crazy stuff in that in that genre. Totally, man. They are coming so sick. And high music level, you yes. know, music, high musicality. Yes. So that's the stuff that we set up. We sit up and, you know, I mean, literally, I have to really work it up. <laughs> you know, I have to spend time with it. That, that's great, though. That's that's wonderful. Yeah, gospel kicked my ass, dude. That, I would say that oh, when, yeah. when I played with the gospel band uh, back, like, years and years ago, that was like my boot yeah. camp. Because I couldn't even hear exactly. the changes. Exactly. I couldn't hear chord right. changes. I was like, where are the changes? Right. <laughs> Where are the changes? Exactly. <laughs> That's how how crazy it is. Yeah, it's man. It's like, man, you have to really, really kind of get up, you know, dissect it just to understand the anatomy of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to really understand it. But, you know, I mean, that's where I'm getting a lot of challenge. And, I'm, and I appreciate it. I like it. Yeah, totally, man. I like you know, I was like, these guys are smashing, man. You know, I mean, it's figures and it's chord cycles and all that stuff that are really dope. Yeah, totally, man. No, I, I, no, I and challenges. Yeah, I seek out gospel players, man. Like when me and my wife are looking to put together, put bands together, we seek oh, out gospel players just because they're <laughs> exactly me too, me too. I want a guy that's got some church on. I don't care. I don't care what yeah. post of the band. You know, um, I like a cat, uh, and especially on the keyboard scenario. Oof, yes. That's, like, super sweet to me, man. Oh, the yes. guy that really kind of has that discipline. Mm -hmm. And I want, you know, he can have the funk, he can have the jazz, he, you know, all of the other stuff. But, man, I like a nice little gospel under undertone or overtone. I don't care if it's an overtone, or, but have some of that. Yes. In your discipline, you know? Oh, yes. I, there's, there's, there's a... There's a uh, uh, a thing, yeah, that comes along comes with that that I need, I, uh, uh, you know, in my especially in my keyboard player. Yeah, man. No, I I dig that yeah. totally, man. Yeah, that's that's where my head no is too, man. So uh, I would like to yeah. talk about um, how you sort of because I know you've spent time doing. And I'm sure everybody asks you about Michael and Quincy and stuff, but I have to. Oh, I have to. Come on. <laughs> so on, how did you get involved on, with Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson? Man, it's funny. And Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones, my involvement came at the, I would say, you know, as a direct result of a friend of mine named Ollie Brown. Drummer? Ollie Brown was drummer Ollie Brown, yes. Okay, yes. Exactly. Ollie Brown, man, is a brother that, I met, um, it was, I was still pretty early. It was quite early in my life and career. I may have been about 22, 23 when I crossed paths with Ollie and Ollie kind of took me under his wing, man, you know, and really, really kind of helped me. Um, as I tried to, you know, as I, as I kind of got launched into the industry, you know, as I, you know, I was starting to get in before I met uh, Ollie. But when I met Ali, man, he, you know, and at that time, this is in the early 80s, you know, the very, you know, the early 80s, 82, 83. And, you know, he had been a legend for some time, you know, done some legendary work. And um, so he was connected to, you know, he had a, he had connection to the Jackson family, mm. you know, and, you know, and, and, you know, Stevie Wonder, he was very highly connected with and. And, you know, he'd also done some work with the Rolling Stones, you know. So, I mean, so by this time, now he was, um, his production career was starting to take off. He was really transitioning. He wasn't doing a lot of playing. He was doing more record production. Oh. And, 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 and so um, he, being aligned with Quincy Jones and, the call came. Firstly, it came. But it came. There was a live, a live performance that Quincy Jones was doing in Los Angeles. It was. It was a benefit. It was like this political benefit fundraiser um, that Quincy Jones was doing, and Ollie Brown was got, got called to play percussion on it. And somehow they needed a bass player for this. I can't believe they needed a bass player. <laughs> You know, they didn't have a bass player. Yeah, I can what imagine the, Quincy yeah, Jones. Where's the bass? 
Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Ali yeah. was able to get my name thrown in that hat, you know? Yeah. But, you know, to come through. And I ended up coming through to do that particular um, live performance. It was, um, in, I think that was around 1986. And um, so, I, you know, I'm the new kid. I'm the I'm the youngster. I'm the I'm the I'm the only person in 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 the scenario that's not already a superstar in my mind. Yeah, you know I'm talking about all the musicians, the artists, everybody that I, that was involved because this is Quincy Jones. So and you know so it was pretty surreal, pretty surreal for me, man. You know to I'm be sure. in that environment. But you know I mean I, I think I'm like 25, 24, 25 years old, and you know I was like man I had to kind of put my big boy. You know, just get in there and, and handle it. Yeah, totally. You know, I couldn't really come off as, as though I was young or starstruck, which I was, but I couldn't really let, it, let that be known. Right. And, and, it, and, it, and it went well. It went very, very well that night. And then um, a year later, Ali was, Quincy had reached out to Ali once again for the, for the Bad album on Michael Jackson. And it's funny, like, I did not play bass. You know, I wasn't, at that time, you know, um, mid eighties, you know, elect the electronic thing was really starting to kick in, oh, you know, yeah. drum machines and, and synths and all that stuff. And I had really gravitated into, into that. So I was quite, uh, a decent, um, drum programmer. Oh, interesting. You know, I really got heavy into the whole MPCs and F9000, you know, the, the Lin 9000s and all yeah, that stuff. The I, Lins, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was into all of that, man. You know, heavy. So how did you they how actually? Did, they, I'm sorry, I, yeah. I just wanted to back up just for one second. How did you actually start sure. getting into programming? Like, how did you make that jump from bass to programming? It was just it was just a natural thing, man. As the '80s kicked in, okay. You know, so you, they were around, so you're you playing with start, them. Yeah, it was just you it just uh, start seeing it. Yeah, it just started showing up, and just start becoming the way. Yeah. You know, and as it became the way, I got into it. You know. And, um, you know, MIDI, you know, MIDI, yes. and, you know, all the whole MIDI scenario. And, you know, I mean, it wasn't, none of that was when I first got in, but shortly after I came in, you know, before you know it here, you know, mm. things are moving into the electric, electronic, yes. MIDI and drum, drum computer thing. So, so you had you know, five years started, on it, you had like a good amount of time on it. And so you were pretty quick and yeah, efficient. By that time, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had been, you know, I've been programming and doing, you know, setting up, you know, you know, now you can almost make your own little home studios and make your own tracks by yourself. You don't yeah. need, you know? Yeah. So that was the very beginning stages of that. Mm. But yeah, so I was, Quince, they, they needed somebody to program drums yeah. for that bad album. So that was by way of Ollie Brown, the call that I got to come 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 on to the Bad Project, and that was the capacity in which I worked. I was I, I did drum pro, drum programming. Okay, tell me about your experience in the studio, like working with Michael and those musicians. Oh man, that was ridiculous, man. <laughs> you know, just ridiculous, man. It was just like, um, what the fuck is this? This is ridiculous. <laughs> In other words, what, what, what I'm saying is, I was so, like, just, I couldn't believe it. It's just too unreal, man. You know, that, that, I'm sitting, I'm standing right here, and two feet away from me is Quincy Jones. And right next to him is Michael Jackson. And, you know, it's just like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Yeah, man. man, this is like, you know, I never anticipated my life and my, you know, me. Yeah. Being in this position, you know. This is, I mean, you know, I mean, I've been playing music since I was a kid. And this is like really, really surreal, for lack of a better term. Of course. But yeah. so, you know, that's what it was, man. You know, we were just kind of in there and I had to c contain myself, you know. <laughs> I found myself having to contain myself just because it was just, you know, again, just like, like on the Quincy gig the year before, you know, everybody in here is a superstar. Mm. I'm talking about the engineers, even the engineers. I, I mean, those dudes, were, I mean, Umberto Gatica and Bruce Swedean, those dudes were like the biggest dudes in the game. Wow. 
You know, and I knew, you know, I mean, I've been following Umberto for many years. You know, it was just so amazing to be kind of in that proximity with these guys. So, you know, we worked, you know, for about about three or four days uh, and, you know, all consecutive days. And, you know, it was pretty, you know, not a whole lot of, um, you know, I mean, it was just work. You know, we were in there, you know, they're putting tracks up and I'm searching and finding sounds and creating drum programs and printing and a being them against other stuff, you know, just trying to make sure it's maxed out as far as, you know, all, all things, as far as what I was there to do. Right. And everybody seemed to be happy and, you know, all my stuff made the albums, you know, you know, so, I mean, it was, it was a, um, a great, um, process overall, man, you know, just a great process. And, um, you know, it's, I've had a lot of moments over the course of my career, you know, that, that were really, really, you know, very, very cool. But that, you know, this was, you know, amongst the top. Well, I, I, can, imagine. I can imagine. I can imagine. Do you have, yeah, do yeah, you remember that, any, yeah, do you remember any interactions with Michael or Quincy or anything? Do you remember any oh, kind of, man, I'll tell you what, man, but I do recall, and I, I've told this story many times, oh, man. Really? the first two or three days was very, it was kind of weird. I found it kind of weird that as we worked in the control room and, you know, um, Michael actually never came into the control room where we were. He, he was at the studio, but there was another loft ab- in the ceiling above the control room where we worked. And Michael, I guess he would get in and he would like before everybody else and set himself up. And I think they had like a, a video camera that he could see what we were doing and audio that he could hear what was going on. It was being piped into that loft area and he could actually see us, but we couldn't see him. And if it, you know, and he never did come in to like, you know, into this control room. Yeah. And he wouldn't, which I, you know, by, you know, I didn't really understand what was going on, but by day two, halfway through day two, like, you know, because what would happen, you know, intermittently, Michael would just kind of yell down. He'd open up the little hatch and, you know, yell for Quincy, Quincy. And Quincy would just give, give me a second, guys, you know, give me a second. Let me go see what Michael wants. And he'd run up to up the loft and then he'd come back down and, okay, guys, let's get back to it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, let's do this. And, you know, so that team to keep going on. And then about halfway through day two, I was like, man, wait a minute. Why, what the hell is going on? Why won't this dude come down? <laughs> I just was like, man, you know, hey, Eric, you know everybody in here. I'm the only new guy. <laughs> you know, and I promise you, I'm cool. You know, if you were to come in, I, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about me. But, you know, everybody just kind of went along with it. You yeah. know, so this is day one, day two. I never saw Michael, you know, yeah. and, but I think the final day was day four, you know, and, um, now this was, a, the, the environment was totally different on this particular, it was a Saturday, I remember, and it was, you know, we were in early in the morning and, um, now this particular day, there were kids at the studio, like maybe six to eight kids. You know, some of the kids, like maybe some of them, I think Greg, Phil and Gaines' children, um, maybe a couple of Quincy's grandchildren were there. You know, kids, you know, they were connected to people that were a part of the project. Right. But, you know, it just happened to be kids, man. And um, I think even Bruce with DN may have brought his dog. Like he had a big <laughs> giant bull massive. He brought a dog. And, you know, so it was like kids and animals. Bubbles was there, Bubbles. The, the chimp. <laughs> yeah, Bubbles was there, you know. Oh, so shit. it was like an entirely different environment on this final day. And um, Michael was extremely, on this day, far more extroverted. He was out of that loft. He was downstairs. He and the kids are playing around and running around and, you know, just... You know, it was like, man, I was like, good Lord. <laughs> like, you know, all the, the kids were like really crazy and Michael was crazy with him, you know? So it's like, 
a whole different vibe. And then, of course, this day we were working on a song called Speed Demon. Oh, yeah. Which is a pretty, pretty, pretty nasty joint. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was, it was nasty. That's you, that's and the, the drums? drums that, yeah. Oh, shit. That's yeah. Good. Dude, you know, yeah, I'm so trying I'm to... Really, I, I just want to cut it in. I'm sorry. This is an amazing story, but I, I just want you to know that that right now I'm listening to that song because I'm working on a synthwave project, which is just 80s music, just rebooted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm listening to that song, trying to get some of those like sounds, those blah, 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 because like there's some runs and not runs, but like some oh, yeah, yeah, drum yeah, rolls in there that stuff, are dude. so distinct that I just love. So that's very interesting. Very interesting. I'm yeah, st- yeah. I'm actually just going over old music, trying to just pick uh, out amazing, certain sounds. Man, yeah. That's fun. That's really yeah, fun. Yeah. Anyways, please go yeah, back to your amazing yeah. story about Michael Jackson. So, so yeah, so this is the day we were actually um, printing Speed Demons. Okay. And um, you know, it was Saturday morning, you know, late morning, early afternoon, and you know, I mean, we had it banging so hard. You know, by the time, you know, I, I, I was finished, you know, you know, cause, you know, it takes a long time. I've got to audition and group up and, you know, I mean, every, every drum, it takes me hours of, you know, you know, they've got the budget and time, right. you know, to you can really spend that kind of time to search out and get the absolute best combinations of, and, and, and you know, everything. So by the time we were like really listening to playback, you know, we're, we're pumping it and, you know, and Michael was down. He was like, Whoa, my God. You know, so he and I were face to face direct, um, you know, for the first time and the only time, Oh wow. you know, yeah. Uh, during that, during that time that we weren't, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, um, we were just able to, you know, we were just able to vibe and, um, kind of enjoy what was going on. And I was able to get his sign off, you know, mm. That yeah. was, you know, like, this is, this is great, man. This is what, this is exactly what I was hoping for, oh you know, all of that, those sentiments. What you an know? incredible compliment. So that, yeah, it was very, very cool, man, you know. <laughs> yeah. And again, just, you know, when you, you know, when you can do a one-on-one type of scenario with, with, a, with a cat like that, you know, it's pretty, you know, the first time, like, if it if it were something that I did with regularity, I'm sure it would have um, became normal. You know, like right. it wouldn't have been as crazy and weird. But it was so cool because you know, in that instant, that was the first time I've ever had that kind of pro- been in that kind of proxi- proximity with Michael Jackson himself working. Yeah. yeah, you know, so it was great. It was great. You know, those moments, those moments in your life that you will never forget. Yeah, I'm sure. Jeez, Louise. So, you know, so it sounds like you're alluding to that you had more experiences with him. Yeah, you know what? After that, man, it, this is the weirdest thing. Um, 1980, like all this stuff was happening in succession. You know, 86 was when I first came together with Quincy. 87 was when we did bad. And then also in 1987, um, and this uh, Michael Jackson would come back into my life in in a in a very very unanticipated unexpected way. Um, I wrote a I co-wrote a song at that time, and this song released and and it really blew up. Oh, nice! It blew up on the on, on the Billboard um, R&B chart. You know, um, on on a uh, with a girl group on Atlantic Records called Madam X. Okay. Yeah, Madam X, and I, um, and the single was called Just That Type of Girl. Oh, nice. And weird song, weird groove. I never ever expected this song to do anything, and it, and it got Atlantic got behind it, and they pulled they pulled all the strings, they promoted the hell out of it, and it blew up. And we topped out at number two. Oh, nice. Hell yeah. Topped out at number two. So what happens is, after the song got out, I, um, and at that time, it was a, it was a, a huge thing to do is to shop your publishing deal. Mm. You know, go to publishing companies and get a publishing contract. Okay. So with this song that has gotten very high, high chart position, 
I have like leverage to go to take into publishing companies to say, hey, I'm a songwriter. I've got this current day hit, you know, and I'd like to, to speak to you about, you know, doing a, doing a publishing deal, a co-publishing. So in this same time frame, I, and I had heard that Michael Jackson had bought a company called the ATV Music Group. Oh, Michael wait. had bought that company. Is that the one with the Beatles and stuff? Is with that, the Beatles catalog. That was yep. that? Oh, my mm-hmm. God. I didn't realize that was back in yep. 87. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that was, yeah. Yep. Awesome. The Beatles, Sly and the Family Stones catalog. Oh, shit. Little Richard. What? You know, I mean, oh my a God. huge, huge acquisition for Michael. Oh, my God. All you ever heard you know, was it was the so, Beatles, but yeah, I didn't realize yeah, it was Beatles, all of them. But there were other catalogs at, at, that ATV owned as well that right. Michael owned all of. Wow, that's incredible. So in, in, what happens was Michael decided after by purchasing ATV that he wanted to go, like all the other publishing companies, into the song solicitation game. Mm. In other words, getting a, a, a stable of songwriters and, you know, soliciting these songs to artists, you know, getting these songs placed. And, of course, Michael would have uh, 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 publishing ownership yeah. by way of us, you know. So what happened was, I mean, I was shopping my publishing with all, you know, the Warner Brothers and the Sony, even the EMIs, you know. And all of a sudden, I got a call. I got a call, man. I'm check this out. I am at Disney World in Orlando, Florida, <laughs> on a gig with, with Ray Parker Jr. Oh wow! I'm nice playing gig. with Ray Parker Jr. at Disney World, oh. and my wife at the time calls me in my hotel room, and, and she's almost in tears. She's almost in tears. She's like, "Dude, uh, I don't know how to tell you this." But Michael Jackson just called. <laughs> and she's just startled. She can't believe she just hung up the phone with Michael Jackson. <laughs> to the point of tears. She's like, she's so in, in utter disbelief that she just spoke to Michael Jackson. Wow. Yeah. And so she calls me almost in tears to tell me, I, Michael just called here and I gave him your number at the hotel. Wow. Oh. And minutes later, I get a call. You know, I get a call, and I swear to you, I thought it was bullshit. I thought it was, actually, I thought it was a buddy of mine playing a prank, and I hung up. Oh, shit. <laughs> I did, man. I hung up, man. I was like, get out of here, Rex, you piece of shit. I know who this is. <laughs> and um, so I ended up, so Michael ended up calling back, and he was laughing. And he was telling me, no, man, for real, it is. It's me. It's me. Don't hang up. Don't hang up. Oh my God. It's me. For real. I'm like, wow, man. <laughs> so what do, to what do I owe the honor? Yeah. And he told me, man, I love this song of yours, man. You've got a song, man, that I absolutely love, man. And well, I did some investigation and I noticed that you don't have a co-publishing agreement with anyone. We we did some we did some investigation on you, and we noticed that your co-publishing is open, and we I'm highly interested in talking with you more about coming on to, with me and be, be, becoming a songwriter for my company. Wow! I was like, this is bullshit. You've got to be fucking kidding me, man! <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> this is. You gotta be kidding me, man. Oh, man. He's like, man, listen, I told him I'm in Orlando, Florida right now, but um, I'll be in LA when I get done with this gig. He's like, well, listen, I'm gonna give you a phone number. My The, per, the person that runs my company is Del Kawashima. I need you to give Del a call and set up a meeting. I wanna sit down with you personally first. And to kind of get more an idea, tell you what it is I'm going for with my company. I'd like to know what it is that you would like to see, what what type of, you know, you know, kind of what, what, what you have in mind. So when you get back to L.A., I'd like to set up a meeting with you. In other words, I had to go by his house in in, in, in Sino. Oh. You know, so that was where, yeah, so we did our first meeting. You know, when I got home, if I, I did, you know, we set up a meeting at the, at the Havenhurst house. You know, 
<laughs> so I'm you talking about the weirdest drive. <laughs> yeah, I bet. just a drive on my way to Havenhurst. I was like, get out of here! <laughs> what? <laughs> I am on my way to Michael Jackson and to the Jackson compound on Havenhurst. This is unreal, man. Like this type of moment. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> It was still unreal, man. I mean, this is 1988, man. Yeah. So at that time, I'm 26 years old, you know? So, you know, I mean, it's just a good time, you know? But sure enough, I did the meeting. I got went to Havenhurst. We sat down. We went into his um, theater. He's got he had this big theater room. And that's where we did our, our face-to-face, just me and Michael. Was he uh, was he kind of aloof or like what was the conversation like? What, I mean, nah, man. Let me tell you what it was in this setting. Uh-huh. Like I say, this is a whole different setting from when we were in the studio. Right. This is a whole different look, and what he was to me as he was as normal as you and I talking right now. Oh, yeah. Just like talking to another dude, man. This dude was so absolutely perfectly normal wow and cool it was just as cool a dialogue as you and i are having right now yeah yeah That's he cool. was candid and funny and normal and you know just you know yeah yeah the only thing the only thing that that had me i was weirded out because i got comfortable you know i was very nervous you know yeah i didn't know what to expect i didn't know what to say i didn't know you know so it was very very nervous but i was made to feel very secure you know, comfortable once we got engaged in the dialogue. But um, what was alarming to me was his nose. Oh, shit. That shit, man, was <laughs> ridiculously small, man. It was way too small for a normal human, I mean, for an adult human male. Yeah. It was way overdone, man. It was just like rodent-like. Whoa. And I was like, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. Now, that is distracting. (laughs) I like, you called it alarming. (laughs) Oh, man. I was was like, I thought this dude was about to say there was like kids in their underwear or something weird like that. No, it's his nose. (laughs) And (laughs) It's his nose, man. You know, that nose, man, was not, that shouldn't have been on an an adult male's face. (laughs) I'm talking about an adult human male. It, it didn't match. <laughs> oh, shit. It didn't match, man, and it was it was very distracting. And I had to <laughs> force myself to not lock in on it. Yeah. <laughs> and and get completely, you know, to the point where I'm not, I can't even hear what he's saying. Oh shit! I'm so caught up in his nose. So that was my that became my my um um what do you call it? A challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Not to stare. To to, to not stare. (laughs) Oh, man. It's like a girl with her tits out. It's like, how could you not? It's like. Not just be like, oh, my God. Man, what the fuck am I. (laughs) You know, to try to play that shit off. (laughs) That is some high stakes. That's some high stakes, man. Yeah. That thing was a challenge, man, in that interview. (laughs) So I'm trying to tell you. So because uh, I mean, this was very, very early in his. Uh, I think it had to been extremely pre- early mm. in his um, like first bouts of um, 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 cosmetic surgery. Okay, yeah. He was just starting doing it, man. Yeah. And they had really went hard and heavy on his nose reduction. <laughs> yep. Hard and heavy. <laughs> They went hard and heavy on it, man. And that shit had me extremely sidetracked. And I mean, I'm literally telling myself, man, look away. Look away. <laughs> Just look, look away. away. <laughs> do not look fuck away. this up by staring at his little ass nose. Yeah, do not look directly in his, in his face, man. You know? Oh, you're going to be fucked. You're going to blow this. <laughs> you're going to blow this whole thing over, over you know, being inappropriate. I, and you, you can, right, you, yeah. yeah, you can only imagine like that. Other people probably were in that same position, like uh, like the whole well, the no, whole I, world I, was. I'm sure I wasn't the only one. Yeah, yeah man. 
so uh, so uh, uh yeah. you know like so from Michael Jackson you you ended up working with him did you end up getting signed to his company I did up, we ended up doing a deal man oh, because, nice. let me tell you what Michael did like I'd had offers, I'd had offers from a couple of different companies, man, that I was really entertaining. Yeah. But Michael Jackson, man, let me tell you what I learned about that dude, and it, it's the same thing that happened with the ATV deal because when he wanted, when he was, when he was bidding for ATV, so was Paul McCartney. Oh. I didn't know McCartney that. wanted it, right? <laughs> but Michael, you know, and you know, they were great friends. Yeah, Thriller. McCartney, I mean, he was on Thriller. But what happens is. All the friendship shit went out the door, man, when it came down to the business. Yeah. And Michael Jackson had enough money, man, that it didn't matter what he wanted. If he wanted it, wow. trust me, you could not outbid Michael Jackson. I don't give a damn who you were. Yeah, not even a Beatle could outbid Michael Jackson. Never. That's insane. No, no. I mean, I mean it got up to 42.5 million and shit like that. And Paul McCartney was struggling. Michael was like, man, I, I, man, I can go on forever. <laughs> Man, look, Paul, just, it's my company, man. Don't I know you want it, and I understand why you want it because it's your music. Oh, I understand why you want I it, but you can't it's have your it. Shit. The doggone girl is it's mine, bro. Shit, I'm sorry, man. It's just too big of a business opportunity, and I can't just, I just can't turn my back on this. I gotta have it. And yeah. he, Michael, did the same thing to me, man. Oh. With my deal, like he doubled down on wow. everything that I was offered man he made it so sweet and so undeniable so i was the second guy that he signed once he bought atv he bought he had one other guy on his roster um and then he signed me second nice you know wow that's... so i ended up writing exclusively for atv for uh you know my you know we ended up doing three years three or four years oh wow damn that's, that's... you know so that's incredible. So you yeah, sure. you have already been writing up to this point. You you had writing credit because he approached you. Uh, was was those when you were in those sessions, or if you, I mean in general, when you're like being paid, when you're a staff writer to write music, what are those kind of pressures mm -hmm. that come with that? Uh, I'm just curious. I've never been a staff writer for anybody. I yeah. I write for people, but not like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, with this. Like you know, you you do you do a deal, and the deal has a monetary um, scenario. You know, you you have your money, and and this is all advancement. Mm -hmm. You're being advanced, right? You know, and this this is money that's being advanced advanced against your your royalties, your back end royalty. Mm -hmm. You know, gotcha. so if you if that's you know, and they're just advancing, you keeping you alive, keeping you afloat. And then once you get your song placed, all back in royalties plus interest mm -hmm. go back to the publisher. Oh, wow. you know, so so it's like a record deal. Yeah. Like it was like it's like a record deal, like a loan. Wow, like a loan. Uh, yeah, yeah, wow. like, like well, you, a record deal. Then back. wow, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, like a record deal or like a loan. So basically, mm -hmm. it's like you can get this money now, or you can wait and get, you'll probably. You get more later if you hold out. Oh, but sometimes oh. you need your money now. Of course, yeah. you know. Yeah, so I mean, I took the money now, mm. but you know, you've got a quota. You've got a certain amount of songs that you've got to turn in per year. Okay. And they are very hard line. You know, most all publishers are very hard line on your quota. Mm. And if you don't turn in, and like I say, if you and I write a song, you and I. And I turn that song in to the publisher. That song, and and and, and so that means I own fifty percent of that song because it's a co-write with you and I. Mm. Then I only fifty percent of song credit towards my quota. Mm. So you and I got to write two songs oh. and that I own fifty percent on to get a full song credit towards my quota. Oh, that's interesting. So you end up turning in a lot more than just. Like, you know, I mean, unless you write everything exclusively by yourself. Right. So, like, like I say, if I write, if, if my, for this particular contract year, I've got a 20 song quarter, 20, you know. So, if I write 20 songs 100% by myself, then okay, I can meet that quarter. But if I'm doing co writes and, you know, things like that, whereas I'm getting a third of the, the total 
um, song um, ownership share, then I only get a third of a song credit towards my quota. So I need to write two thirds more to make a full song. Oh, yeah. You know, so. Wow. So say if, if me and this two other people write three songs, then I'll get one song credit right. that we turn in, you know. So then I got only 19 more songs mm. for a full 100% value. So it turns out to be a lot of work. Yeah. You got to get on, you know, I, either you got to write all that shit yourself. Or if you're doing collaborations, which I was, I was doing a lot of collaborations because I was collaborating with artists and a lot of the artists that I was producing, we were co-writing songs or I was doing, you know, so I had to really bang and, 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 and put a lot of music together, you know, to make the make quota. Yeah, I imagine. So that's when the pressure comes about, you know, ah, gotcha. it's like, you know, yeah, because you got to make your quota <laughs> and um, you and you negotiate the deal. See, me being so early in, like I had, I think my first year was a 20 song quarter and I was pissed off because Michael signed a couple other guys after me and those dudes got more money and sm sh smaller song quarters. Oh. I was like, God. Oh, <laughs> Come you on. You know, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, guys that I had, um, I mean, and then they asked me, Del Kawashima, you know, to refer them to people that they thought would be good fits for the ATV music um, songwriter staff. So I was, I, you know, these are guys that I turned on and I, I was able to kind of help them get their publishing deal. Oh, nice. And they ended up sweeter deals than me. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. So I see. I see. <laughs> damn. So, but, but... I was like, wow, man. I mean, I'm happy for you guys, but damn. I'm struggling <laughs> trying to get my shit. And you guys are on it. You guys are breathing through and getting higher, higher um, advances. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a rough ticket. That's a rough ticket. So, you, but yeah, you know, but but you, it seems like you learned a lot from that deal, and you absolutely, learned. man, it was the greatest experience, man. And um, another super great friend's benefit of being signed to ATB and Michael was, um, literally for three years, man. You know that very same house where I had the meeting with Michael initially, yeah. Havenhurst. Because Michael had he had bought Neverland by that time, and and he ultimately ended up moving out of um, Havenhurst and to Neverland. Oh, okay. While I was signed to, 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 and during, during while I was doing my um, publishing deal, during the time that I was on the deal, so but we all of us as Michael's writers, Michael had an extremely awesome stoop recording studio at Havenhurst. And um, being signed to um, ATV, we had 100% 24-7 access to Michael's room. Oh, shit. That's Anytime so cool. we needed it. Holy Just shit. to record our demos. Just demo. <laughs> so if we want to go in, demo up a song, all we have to do is call into the office, set up time, you know, because, you know, it was only one room. Yeah. And there ultimately were five of us. So we had to, you know, schedule it, you know, and we were all working all the time. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's absolute 48 track digital, you know, um, absolute, you, you just unreal. Yeah, I'm um, sure. Studio. I'm sure. Yeah. Jeez Louise. That we, we had 100% access to, you know, it was our, it was our room. God, you, man. And, you know, we'd call in, the company would clear us at the, at the, at the guard's desk, you know, so I spent countless uh, a countless amount of time at Havenhurst over those three years that I was um, doing APB and it was awesome I got it that's why and I really got to be close with the, all the, that entire family wow you know, through, through working for Michael you know I really got to be very very dear friends with Randy Jackson and oh, wow. Tito Jackson um, even to this day I work for um, Tito's sons even now Tito's sons um are super talents. Oh, uh, they, they they had a band called Three T. Okay. And yeah, Tito's these are Tito, Tito Jackson's sons, and I mean they're my dear friends, man. You know, and I work work for them all the time, even now. 
Oh, right on, man. That's so cool. Yeah, man. Fuck it. So, so they got they got that super talent from the family. They they they're one of those like super players. What? Oh, I mean, they got a bunch of they got a, a whole lot of it just trickled down, man. <laughs> yeah, I love how I'm it just it. goes through gen- genes like that. Uh, so, oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, you know, they've got quite a bit of talent, and you know, and if, either they're directly involved or they're involved business wise. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm talking about the the, the, the offspring the, of the of the of the Jackson boys. It, you know, it, it's really really cool. Is there anything? What what what's the most valuable thing that you feel like you you learned from the your whole experience with Michael Jackson from bad to cute to Michael Jackson? What what was the biggest thing that sort of rings out to you that you kind of learned and applied to your life going from that point forward? Man. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty tough um, question overall, man. I know, I know. It's very vague yeah, in general. Yeah, so one, the one big thing, I mean, you know, that's hard to really pinpoint. Of course. One big thing that I learned, I mean, you just, like, like at that time, you're talking about, um, what, 32 years ago. Oh, yeah. You're talking about three, three right. years or so ago. <laughs> so what do you remember? I was, young, I was, I was a lot younger right, than right. I am now. And um, I was, you know, I learned so much, you know. No, I, I understand. To where there's just a plethora of, of lessons that I took away from those, from, that, from those opportunities. You know, from business to personal to music to... You know, yeah, I'm um, sure it's hard to just put it in one word. It's really hard to really pinpoint, you know, yeah. to really break it down to, you know, one thing that I may have taken away from it, man. Well, you know, it was just, yeah. Well, what I'm curious about is that you were so young when all these things are happening. I, I'm just like, I, whenever I talk to somebody, I always project my own experience onto them. So this is what's happening now. I know that when I'm, uh, when I was 19 and I was like 25 and 26, my maturity yeah. level, like who I was, my alcohol and drug use was way out of control. I called myself a musician. What? But I, I, what I'm saying is, like, when you're young, you're doing dumb things, you're you're experimenting, you're figuring life out. I'm just curious, were right. you um, were you very focused, or did you have a, you know, were you going crazy because it's like, hey, I'm fucking oh 25 and I'm fucking. <laughs> let me tell you, man. You let me tell you, this is the '80s, man, and I was a young, um. Let me see. I really want to frame this cor- perfect, correctly for you. Sure. At that time, man, um, yes, I was going crazy. You know, I was, you know, it, it, drugs were the thing to do. It was social and it was accepted and it was cool. And, hey, you know, uh, thing, you know, some things were just kind of in their way onto the scene. And, I mean, trust me, I was all in. <laughs> When it when it came to it, and um, so by the eighties, and and uh, you got to keep in mind, man. When I did my deal with ATV, like I think, uh, I mean, my deal was over the duration of the contract was just a little under a million dollars <sighs> that I would get in advances. Yeah, damn. you know. So and then at that same time, man, this is. I also scored an incredibly huge road gig, touring a touring gig as a bass player with Kenny Loggins. Oh shit! Okay, hell yeah, yeah. And Kenny was super hot at that time. Was man. that Top Gun he, era? Top Gun time, okay. right off that Top Gun uh-huh. tour. God damn! So we were touring off of, off, off of Danger Zone and hell yeah. you know all that. Stuff. So it was a massive time. So I'm making money like you would not believe, man. I got Michael Jack money coming. I got, and I'm twenty. I'm 27 years old. Right. And I mean, you 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 go a year prior to that. I'm broke. Oh shit. Yeah, I'm living in Compton, and I'm broke, and I'm, you know, um, you know, it just it just all happened in a in overnight. And having that kind of money, man, I lost it. 
Oh, yeah. I lost it. I mean, of course, I went, I bought a house, I bought two vehicles, I bought the entire Guitar Center, <laughs> I bought an I bought Guitar Center Hollywood, the entire store. What, you, you bought know? the store? Damn near. Okay, okay, I was going to say, okay, 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 I get it. I get what you're saying. I bought damn near every every piece of merchandise they had. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, just went in there and just went berserk. <laughs> and, um... Yeah, so, you know, I mean, um, and then, like I said, you know, I had this money, man, and so, yeah, I mean, we partied with it, and, you know, so I ended up, it ended up, you know, and my drug use ended up taking over mm. my life, and I, so I ended up going through, put it this way, I lost just about everything that I had acquired during that period of time by... Okay, fast forward to the early 90s, mm -hmm. 1992, 1993, and I partied so hard through 88, 89, 90, 91, you know, I mean, I'd had all this money, bought this, uh, you know, acquired all this shit, you know, and it was, that was the tumultuous time mm -hmm. from, I would say, 88 till about 92. I really, really went berserk, man, and, um... You know, yeah, and then and then it would be some, it would be some years after that. You know, I mean, it slowed down. You know, I mean, I had lost so much. I had acquired and lost so much by nineteen ninety four. Let's say ninety from eighty eight to ninety four. That's about a six year period mm. that um was extremely tumultuous. You know, too much crack, too much blow. Too much, you know, just too much. Yeah. It's too much. Young and yeah, rich, so, um, young with money young and, and, money, yeah. and an addiction young problem. Young with money and no discipline. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, I, that's what it was for me. I thought I was just another one of those, oh, another statistic in that regard. Oh. So 94, now it didn't get a whole lot better. <laughs> it really didn't get better because, I mean, it, then it became an on and off. I mean, it was constant from 88 through 94. I mean, I was oh. just. It was just one long episode mm. for about those six years. But then from 94, and it wasn't until really 94, for the next 15 years, from 94 to 09, wow. well, it, it, I battled up and down, off and on. Wow. You know, it, it just hit me. It really took me until 09. It's only been these past 10 years of my life. And like, I'm 58, I'll be 58 this year. Oh shit! You know, yeah. It it was only so. It's only been like the last ten years mm. of my life now that I've had real kind of stability. Yeah, and you know, I've been able to really keep the demon at bay. You know, yeah, yeah, totally. That, well, congratulations, man. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, that's, you that's, know, that's no small yeah. accomplishment, man. That's amazing. Now, I'm, oh, I'm no, man, I'm very, very thankful. Yeah, for, for what I've been able to do. And and what I've been able to you know withstand and come out of it with somewhat of a reputation still intact <laughs> and a career. Well, I mean, because yeah, so, I fucked up, man. I fucked up a lot of stuff, stuff, man. A lot of I fucked up a lot of people. Yeah. And so for people to give me another opportunity, another chance, and to say, okay, Corny, we knew we knew it wasn't you. It was what you were going through. You know, yeah. we know you were going through something, but you, you in and of yourself are not that guy. Yeah. A lot of people took that position and I'm extremely grateful, man. Yeah. And you know, so it's like for these last 10 years, I've just said, man, Oh man, I will never ever put my career in that sort of, um, jeopardy again. Not, you know, just me. Yeah. In and out of my own decision. Just just go out and do some stupid shit that's going to jeopardize everything that I've, you know, because I've had to totally rebuild life. Yeah. Because everything was gone, man. I, everything was gone, man. I mean, I was on the street. I was destitute, wow. you know? What no, nah, man, I'm literally living in parks and living in my car. Oh, and, my God, damn. Uh, that's, yeah, that's absolutely hard. homeless. You know? All that shit. That's hard to imagine from from you yeah, know Michael in Jackson. Jail, you know, well, and 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 yeah. we and, and we kind of skipped over this, but like you also were in uh, Death Row. You were involved in Death Row Records right. in uh in Absolutely. some of their bigger times as well. 
Um, if yeah. you don't mind, we I would love to talk about it. I actually I talked to somebody well, that you might know. I don't know. Do you know? Did you know a bass player named Tony Green? Hell yeah! Okay, All right. okay, awesome. I had him on yeah. the podcast uh, a couple years ago. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, and, yeah. Tony Green, uh, another guy, Death Row dude. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I, yeah. I actually. Oh. Cause uh, he was telling me some of his stories, and and I, I kind of wanted to just compare and contrast your guys' experiences because it sounds like yeah yeah it seems like that you guys I'm assuming you guys had the same experience kind of but not exactly of course well yeah you know Tony Green was there before me and he was there in the Dre days yes yes that's what I was gonna say like it, yeah. I think Tony was leaving when you were coming in correct yeah Tony left out see he was part of the the, the team. That that came in with Dre, and now here's the crazy part: I didn't come in the death row with Dre, mm. but Dre and I are straight up cousins. <laughs> oh shit! He's my cousin, man. Oh okay. You guys from the same yeah, neighborhood, or family, no? We're family, man. I, you just you know, family. I mean, literally. Um, yeah. Um, it's it's um like he's my younger cousin. You oh, know, okay. he's younger than me. Mm. You know, yeah. but um. We're family, man. Hell but sure yeah. enough, Dre and Drake and Snoop and and you know they did the the the, the beginning stages of Death Row Records, and um, that you know it blew up. You know it was great. It was great what they did. You know that whole um, the Chronic. Yeah. You know everything. You know it was great, man. But I was not a part of that. Because at that time, I was connected to DJ Quick. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm hmm. And he. Uh, DJ Quick was my dude. Okay, okay. And then so, so mm -hmm. he sort of brought you in. Yeah, see, after, after um, Dre and Suge parted ways, mm -hmm. Suge approached Quick to basically come in and be that lead guy, lead producer lead and artist and everything which quick has the has the ability to, to be yeah well i mean he has amazing uh he is an amazing producer on his own uh oh, so he was kind of taking the dre one. place he was kind of replacing dre exactly yeah okay. so that's what happened and we got brought in we got brought into death row by way of um quick okay so so quick came in we did murder was the case the soundtrack the, Soundtrack. Yeah, okay. the first thing we did. Yeah, was was murder was the case, but partially as we were doing that, um, Suge was also negotiating and working out some arrangements with Tupac while he was still in jail. Oh, okay. You know, to get him out of jail, sign him, do a deal with him to death row, and put a record out on him. So once they kind of got put all that in motion, they got um, Tupac on the street again, got him to L.A. We went 100% hard and heavy, death row. Everybody connected to death row. It was all about Pac. Mm. Everybody, all producers, all writers, all musicians, everybody connected. You know, they just did a total shift to all eyes on me is what that became you know once they went 100 percent hard and heavy everybody all producers everything was all about tupac mm. so you got two and three rooms going simultaneously everybody's working on shit for Pac. okay you know and Pac is just bouncing from one room to the next listening hey i like that let me write something let me get on that then that becomes a joint then he'll go to another room, listen to that. Hey, I dig that. Let me drop let me drop a lyric on that. Good on that. Okay. And you know, so it was just like a big ass um assembly line. Oh, okay. Like a little factory. A, a production, man. Yeah. A little like... factory, man. It was dope, man. I, I enjoyed well, you know, and I did the the bulk of the work of but now um Suge and Quick have now parted ways. Oh. Although Quick brought us in, something went down with Sugar and Quick where they didn't see eye to eye. Quick bounced, 
and left us there. <laughs> you know? He left you with the wolves. <laughs> yeah, left us there, but we ended up connecting with a cat named Johnny J, right? Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, Johnny J. Johnny J is the cat who ended up taking over the, the lion's share of um, Tupac's um, production. Okay. And it was really, really a great experience, man. I really enjoyed Johnny. Johnny's my dude. Peace, man. I hate this dude committed suicide, man. Ugh, that's it's, you know, still troubles me, man, that Johnny killed himself. You know? Yeah, of course. But, um, yeah, so we ended up getting all eyes on me done, man. You know, I mean, we cut probably 300 or more tracks. Oh, wow. In a, maybe a three, three to four month period. Wow. You know, so that's why they kept coming with more product on product. There's still so much stuff, even to this day, 20 years later. There's still there's Tupac stuff songs that, out there. Still Tupac stuff that he that he actually um, is on, that Pac is actually on. Wow. That still hasn't seen, seen the light. It still hasn't um, come out yet. That's, that's nuts. What yeah, w- there's a lot of stuff done, man. It sounds you like... Know, so that's just, you know... Yeah, no, it sounds like creatively it was awesome. Um, but, you know, we know the stories. We've heard them. Uh, like, what oh, yeah, was man. like I the... Mean, it was great creatively, but now Tupac on the personal, man, I couldn't stand that motherfucker, man. Oh, really? What? Well, really? Oh, I hated him. Him, <laughs> personally. Yeah. Now, him, personally, oh, man, that dude is a piece of shit, man. Oh, that's that's disappointing. Not cool. Not cool. He was not a cool dude, man, and I and I don't like that shit, man. It was just like this dude is being, you know. I mean, I knew somebody was gonna kill Pac. Oh shit! I knew somebody was gonna do. So that motherfucker was gonna end up killed by someone's going to kill him. And if this motherfucker keeps fucking, you know, if I see him, you know, I mean, I kind of wanted to kill him. Oh jeez. I did. I really did, man. You know, I saw him do shit, man, that made me really want to kill his ass. Wow. What? This one fucking blew his mind, man. And, but the only thing was, he never did anything to me directly. Mm. Yeah. None of that bullshit. I mean, I, the bullshit I saw him do to people, he never did it to me directly because I swear this motherfucker would have never, ever been able to just do that shit to me and continue. <laughs> and continue to breathe and yeah. continue to. You know, shit like that, and, and, and to continue to have a pulse and shit like that. <laughs> no way. What what kind that of stuff did you see him do that? Shit. What 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 stuff was he doing that you didn't like that made you hate him? It's just like um. Okay, but here's the deal. When you know he had been in jail, he'd been locked up, and then um, he just you know he got sprung um um sprung out of jail should. Put up, I think they put up a, a 1.4 mil yeah. to get him out. And um, so when he got down, and, and then, you know, there was a persona associated with Death Row Records, right? Right. Death Row and, you know, all that old gangbanger shit, you know, that gangbanging sort of mindset and mentality that they were all kind of kind of portraying and putting out there, you know. Blood shit, you know. All you think is it's all blooded out and, you know, it's all about the red, you know. You know, and, and so Tupac just really, you know, when he got out and he got free and we got in the studio and all that shit, he was just all about that, that thuggy shit. Ugh. You know, it was just that thug, 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 man. It's like, man, look, that shit is immature, man, and childish and stupid, and it's going to get you fucked up. Yeah. You can't do this to people. You can't just be this, like, I can say anything to anybody at any time, and ain't nobody going to ever check my ass. I'm like, motherfucker, you living in a, a straight up, so I can't wait for, for the day that somebody checks this nigga. I cannot wait for somebody <laughs> to check people's ass for real. It's going to happen, and I knew it was going to happen. Because this dude would just say and do anything. I remember one time we were in the studio. Um, we were, you know, I think it was Johnny J was producing. 
um, we, he and Suge came into the studio at, you know, as we were working. And there was a song that we had worked on and he was looking, he wanted to hear the, the mix or rough mix that was done of a track. So in these days, this is in the mid nineties, 95 ish, you know, um, it was what they call digital audio tape or DAT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. ADAT. Yeah. Yeah. ADATs and DATs and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So the, the mix was that he was looking for was on a DAT. Um, um, she was, um, oh no, I'm sorry. So, um, you had to go into the, into the vault and pull out this particular, whatever that tape, you know, so we could hear the mix. So the engineer, the young white kid named Mike, it's funny. Mike goes into the vault. Yep. Pulls out the, um, pulls out the uh, tape that he thought was the mix. It turns out to be the wrong version, right? Mm -hmm. It happens to be an earlier version, something not quite the mix that we're, they were looking to listen to. So all that would take is just a simple, hey, man, no, this is the wrong mix, man. Go back. And... So Tupac walks up to Mike, motherfucker, what the fuck is this shit you pulled out? And I mean, he's just like, like he knocks him out cold. Jesus. <laughs> Literally just punches the dude in right between his eyes and knocks him out cold. Wow. Yeah. And, and then just starts laughing. Everybody talking, <laughs> shook, and everybody they just start laughing like it's some like it's like oh it's some cool funny shit to do what to somebody. The fuck? That's awful. That is man, I swear to God, man, I looked at that shit, man, and I was like, wow, man. I swear to God, man, I, you know, I felt bad for Mike because Mike was the nicest kid, <laughs> a very cool kid. And that shit was unnecessary. And um, if it were me, either everybody would, you know, I would have came back and got these motherfuckers or I, every, everything in that studio would have been mine. I would have sued the living shit out of Suge, Pac, Death Row, Can-Am Recording Studio. Everything I would have ended up paid. Yeah. I would have never let them out the hook for that Hell shit. Hell no. Hell no. You know, but this is the type of thuggy shit that Tupac was on. You know, just you know, instead of just being an adult, and you know, again, this was twenty something years ago, and I think you know because he had been locked down and now he's free, and then. um this is prior to, you know, California Love had not even released yet. This We're still oh, working on the album. You know? Yeah. But, man, after the first single, which is California Love, drops, and, of course, it even... Because, you know, Pac has been in jail and all that stuff. So his... The, the, the single came out, and it was number one in the first week. Wow. Yeah, it was... Number one... Um, First week out. So, you know, you couldn't say nothing to this motherfucker now. Yeah. His yeah, head yeah. is so, you know, he is so just out there. Right. He's got number one record. He's with Death Row. He's with Suge. He's, it's Thug Life. And I'm like, man, ah, oh, this dude's going to die, man. I know it. So when he ended up dead, man, I swear to God, I, I, I'll never forget, I was in Germany. Germany with Tito Jackson's sons. I was on tour with 3T. Tito's kids were huge at that time. This was in 1997. Hmm. Now, I'm never man, being in Germany in a laundry mat, doing my laundry, and looking at a TV that, um, that was on a laundry mat on MTV, German. It was German MTV. I couldn't even understand the, the language, but I could see where they brought Tupac's picture up. And then, you know, it was from 1971 through 1997. Oh. You know, the, 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 I saw that. Yeah. That's the only reason I knew that that would constitute him being dead. Right. And I was like, man, you got it, man. Look at that. That shit is, it, it, it's gone down. He's like, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. It's like, I was... knew it was going to happen. And so I, I, I was interested then to, know, to, to, to get the particulars. Mm-hmm. 
well, how the fuck did this dude end up there? Because I had seen him that that year, Mother's Day, would be the last day that I saw him on Mother's Day of that year. We did, Death Row did a, um, like this Mother's Day benefit concert. It was very nice, too, in Beverly Hills, California. And then they actually, she caught me to musical, you know, because I would musical direct everything for Death Row. They would call me anytime they needed a live band. If they needed live a live band scenario, they would always call me for it mm. to put it together. So I put that together and Tupac performed. And of course, you know, he had Dear Mama. Yeah. So that was like, you know, um, a big portion, a big part of that whole thing. But this would be the last time I would actually see him alive. Mm. You know, was that that Mother's Day death row thing? Did you have good experiences performing with him? Or no, man. What was I, your experience as performing? Whack, whack as hell. <laughs> oh, okay. um, him, he was whack as fuck. We did Saturday Night Live. That's the only other performance I did was, um, I, you know, they called me to put the band together for Saturday Night Live in '97, mm. and um, you know that was a ridiculously, um, oh, I hated the experience. I mean, I put the band together, and I mean, the band is killing we really really i mean i love my arrangements you know um but it was just tupac i thought tupac was just i thought he was terrible yeah like on top of us you know <laughs> and the reason why i thought he and i know why he was terrible because he was nervous he never showed up at any rehearsals i did like two weeks of rehearsing Damn. prior to leaving for new york to do saturday night live and this idiot never shows up for any rehearsals as a matter of fact, he even fucked off the rehearsal in New York at Saturday Night Live. He, he wasn't even there for that. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, he no-showed him and Suge were no-show for the camera block rehearsal on Thursday prior to the Saturday that we were to tape. Oh, damn. And it was an extremely, you know, extremely important scenario for NBC. NBC is like, you know, I mean, and for the show. Mm -hmm. That rehearsal is imperative. Yeah, yeah. That totally. Thursday rehearsal, but he didn't show up. So we never saw him until Saturday, right before taping. Oh, Jesus. And he had never even ran over the, the song with us. He, he barely even knew it. Oh, my God. And like, so when I, every time I look at it, I've looked at it, and I can look at it even now, I can tell, like, he doesn't even really know the arrangement. Ugh. And his nervous energy, because he was nervous and unsure, caused him to not really flow but to scream. No, it's almost like he's screaming. I don't yell. 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 I don't Oh, that sucks, man. That sucks. Why are you Someone... screaming like this, man? And he's so talented, too. Like, his talent... I mean, there was not, no question he was talented. Like a... but... In contrast, yeah. in contrast, all of the time that I spent with him on um, in the studio, and when I watched him, I got a chance to see him create. I'm talking about from Jump Street, from start, and go all the way down and write a lyric so fucking quick. And I mean, it would be prolific and it would be dope. And this dude was super quick at it. Wow. Like to have that sort of a talent to come up with a story and a theme and, and spit the shit out and have it arranged. He really was a talented guy. Right. And I admired that talent on him, man. I thought he was, I was I, like, I can't do what he did. I don't have that. I just don't have that. So that's why I saw him do it and I respected it, you know, and he respected, I know he, they respected what I did and us, the live guy and the musician guys did. They really dug us. So, you know, we had a mutual respect in that regard and somewhat of an admiration. Yeah. But he and Suge were just on some childish ass, young, thuggy, stupid shit. And these guys are, you guys are, got million do millions of dollars at your disposal 
to, you know, you guys are in this shit and, and you guys choose to be these fucking idiots, man. I'm no. not with that shit. No, not at all. You know, and see, I'm older than them. You know, I'm, I'm older than Suge and those guys, you know. So I just, you know, those, I was like, man, you guys, by that time, you're talking about the mid 90s. I'm born in 1961, so I'm like 35 years old now. Right. Yeah. And I'm close. I'm in my mid 30. You know. And these guys are and acting like I'm children. Kinda, I'm kind of trying to come back from all the drug use mm. and all the loss from the 80s, late 80s into the early 90s. Like I'm trying to rebuild my career, and you know, so I don't. I'm not really down for a bunch of stupid shit at this stage in my life. Of course, you know, because I had been through so much shit through the early '90s, and yeah, I mean, you know, so much you know, everything. So now it's mid, mid, moving into the later '90s. I'm trying to build some shit back up. No, Tony told me about how um, how he had to really go and fight for his royalties through death row, and he and he still Absolutely. he still actually his kids are his little, his employees who go out and try to find all the sure. tracks that he was involved with so he can get his royalties. Yeah. So I'm just mm-hmm. curious, did you have that same experience? Yeah, man. Um, death row has always been notoriously bad. At cataloging information, you know, yeah, uh, keeping keeping proper records, like even on, on all eyes on me, there are credits that I never got, mm-hmm. and 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 you know some and see nowadays there are royalties that come to p- players. Writers, you know, but if they have no record of you, you can't get that royalty. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's yeah. So yeah, you'll never receive that royalty. Yeah, that's that's sucks, and death row, Yeah, death row is notorious. Like, there's a song on um, a later Tupac record um, that I did called um, "Thug Mansion." Mm-hmm. You know, this is um, um it, it came out. I, it's came out after All Eyes on Me. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but um, I'm, I'm playing bass on it, Big as Day, and um, they've got somebody else totally, you know, so I had to literally go to Death Row and go to um, um, even my, uh, let's see, who did I go to? The Recording Academy. Uh-huh. And get that credit, get that credit changed to me. Wow. You know, I had to get that yeah. <laughs> I to get that credit changed over. But All Eyes on Me is just so many songs. And there's a song on, on that album that I just got into a big um, discrepancy with. And all these years later, just earlier this year, a guy named Doug Rashid. And Doug Rashid, he worked on... He worked on a track that I ended up replacing him. He played bass. And then they they called me in and I replaced his bass with mine. Mm. And so mine, mine made the actual album. And he's under the impression that I'm my track is him. Oh. You can't tell I'm like, no, you I can't don't. tell that's not him. <laughs> he don't know. Because actually what I did was I recreated him mm. and I replayed to a degree. But I did there's some extra shit in there, some extra grease yeah. that I put on it that he definitely didn't do. And like, I know me, I do know me when I, when I hear me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I I remember there was a baseline and they wanted me to replay it, but they wanted me to do some extra, go a little crazier on it. You know, his track is a little too straight and a little too mild mannered. Can you just kind of take it and make it, make it, you know, put, put a little more on it. So that's what I did. But this Mm -hmm. dude, he and I almost got, you know, we had a knock down drag out argument. Over, that's me. I'm like, dog, dog, man. Listen, I'm not trying to take no credit for some shit I didn't do. I'm not. I, I ain't got too much pride. <laughs> I don't ever want nothing. I, you know, I don't ever want credit for something I didn't do. Right. Man, I know I'm far too talented and far too, you know, I've got, you know, too much that too much, you know, that I can do that I'm able to do. Yeah. To yeah. ever have to somebody else's shit 
man, I man, I'm gonna applaud you if you if you did some shit and it's dope. Man, you did. That's you, man. Because I got enough dope shit out there. I don't need to take your credit. Right. That's me, brother. Listen to it. Um. Listen to it. Man. Yeah, man. Yeah. It, so, so, so you left Death Row. When did you decide to get out of Death Row? Well, the whole Death Row thing just kind of. Um, let me see. The the last. I think the last thing that we really all did. And this, and it was kind of great because it kind of allowed us to do the last thing that we were to do with Death Row. It was super positive. Hmm. It was super fun and super cool. Oh, that's good. Almost a year, almost a year to the day, damn near a year to the day after we did Saturday Night Live with Tupac, and that was a disaster. <laughs> we went back to Saturday Night Live again. And this time it would be with Snoop. And so, of course, Death Row calls me again. Hey, man, we're going back to Saturday Night Live. And Snoop, you know, also, although Snoop was basically done with Death Row, mm-hmm. he had one more album that he had to deliver, and that would be The Dog Father. Uh, yeah, The Dog Father Project. Uh, so, yeah, so that was what we, he ended up, and then he, he did a, um, he did um, Saturday Night Live a year later, and I put this damn near the same band that I used on Tupac together, and we went and did Snoop. And the experience with Snoop was an absolute day and night difference. Yeah. I and, heard Snoop- you know, I mean, on all levels. Yeah, I heard Snoop is actually a pretty diligent, and he's a hardworking musician. Um, absolutely. Uh, do you man. know? Absolutely. Do you he's know who great. Bubby Lewis is? He's a bass player. Oh, I know Bubby very well. Oh, he's my boy, man. Okay, yeah, okay. Since he was young. Yeah, oh, yeah, Bubby's my boy. He's a younger guy. He used to play with Snoop, and and um, I, I, yeah. I mean, a long time ago, I got to chat with him backstage, um, and he was telling me how great he is as a play, as just like oh, he's yeah. just very professional, a very professional. I mean, he hey, has all this weed smoking shit, but you know, he shows up. Oh no, no, but no, no, he's a pro, and he's a very, very down. Uh, he's about business, mm. and he's not, you know, and like, like I toured. I actually musical directed Snoop, um, back in ninety. 98 I musical directed a, a European run for, for Snoop nice and it was the absolute greatest experience man you know he's just um, all about having a good time man all about you know getting it right having fun you know of course they smoking weed <laughs> but you know I wasn't you know, it was all good man yeah I mean it was just a day and night you know no, no funny business with the money yeah as a matter of fact <clears throat> I was owed thousands of dollars by death row on sessions. Wow. Right? Sessions that they hadn't paid me for. And, but then they called me to do the band for Saturday Night Live to Snoop. And I was like, man, I, Snoop is my dude, and I would love to do it. But, man, look. And um, I told Snoop, man, death row owes me too much damn money, man. I can't fuck with them yeah. until, they, until they handle this business, man. That's over 20 G. In session yeah. monies that I'm, man, it took, I, after I spoke to you, in a matter of three hours, um, I got a call from Death Row. I got a call from Death Row, man, they figured out and they got me every penny. Wow. Owed to me. Thanks to Snoop Dogg. Wow. Snoop out there, out there looking out for for the for the for the other guys. That's nice. Absolutely, Snoop looked out, got me my, got me that money, and we were able to put that band together and um, got over to um, got over to um, Saturday Night Live, and it was you know you you, and I know Saturday Night Live was was nervous because uh, you know some of the guys were there when we came with with, with Tupac, right. It was such a disaster just a year prior. Yeah. So, jeez, we... so it was so cool that you know, and so we got back over there, and the experience was very cool. Well, that's great, man. 
so I, I kind of want to since you you know like you you're you're clean and you're sober um and you're still very yeah. active and and i saw on your uh your credits that you have uh that you worked with the fantastic negrito and india re Absolutely. and ray j and so so it's not like yeah. death row was the end it, it seems like you got sober and you just sort of went harder uh is that would Man, that be fair you know, to say it would be an absolute fair assessment, man. You know, um, you know the, the, the game for me, it has never stopped. You know, even at my worst times of life and going through the drug thing, man, you know, um, there was always opportunity that was in front of me. Like, I was so fucked up at, at a point in time until I, w- I wouldn't go to that opportunity. Wow. You know, people kept 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 offering it to me. I just had to get myself back into a mindset that I even wanted to accept the opportunity yeah. and to 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 really take it on again. You know, because I'd gotten real depressed and real disillusioned about life. You know, yeah, at a cool. point. You know, like man, damn, I keep. You know, I don't want to repeat the process of building and you know acquiring and winning just to throw it all away again. My, let me just stay here in the gutter. Yeah. That's why I thought for years, I just stayed in the gutter, man. I mean, literally homeless for over a year. I mean, I lived in Watts, California, man, just on in parks. And, Jeez. You know, man. I told my man, literally, I mean, I went weeks without showers and, you know, a lot of jail time, you know, a lot of time, you know, because I'm panhandling and stealing to eat, you know, shoplifting just to eat and, you know, getting caught and, you know, going to jail and all that stuff. The whole thing, man, I did. And I've been through all of it. Wow. So, um, you know, it really has been a continuous journey. You know, the journey has been continual. And um, I don't anticipate music ever until I take my last breath. Put it that way. It'll yeah. stop then. Wait, do you, yeah, what, but as long I'm, as I'm alive and there is music. I'll, I'll I'll have something to do. I think that's beautiful, man. I I'm I'm just curious. What was it that sort of? What was the moment where you're like, I need to stop, you know, smoking crack and stealing? Yeah, and what, what was that moment? Well, man, you know, it's been you know, I, again, you know, it, it was a, a a lot of up and down. Mm-hmm. I say those 15 years from 1994 to 2009. Right. You know. There, there, those episodes, those, you know, like I go a couple of years clean, you know, you know, in the program and really trying to, you know, just really keep an alignment and then falling and just throwing it all away and going, you know, but I never really, really, um, what ended up happening too was I finally, I would say at around, oh, let me think. Oh, nine ish. You know, I kind of was able to put the drug, the cocaine element kind of totally behind me. But then I ended up transferring it, man. I ended up then now that I'm just going to (laughs) drink. Yes. Yeah. The the good old crutch alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it turns out, man, my addictive personality. You know, I never thought that drinking, I, I would drink myself to a place that I would be unable to function. Yeah. I never thought, but it ended up, it, it spun. Drinking spun into that, it, it, it became equally debilitating as crack and cocaine. Most definitely. Before I knew it, I couldn't do anything. You know, I wasn't going to work no more. I wasn't going to work on alcohol. Yeah, man. Or I was, you know, waking up in the morning and it was, and so it was really the, I'm trying to think, the final epiphany, the final epiphany that really has got me, you know, to the place where I am now. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> it so just really has been a thing as, you know, as days have transpired, days here in recent years. I, I kind of just has made a decision, man. I just decided that, man, I need, I'm going to need quality for the rest of the days that I'm on this earth. Yeah. And 
it, and the way I see it is with each day that passes, I'm getting that. That's another day that I'll never have any again. And that's a day closer to me not being on this earth anymore. Yeah. Because I'm definitely, the day is coming, man. The day is, it's inevitable. That day that I will no longer breathe is on its way, man. I'm, I'm a fucking death in the making as far as I'm concerned. Of course. It's going down. Yeah. Man, so i got to make sure that these days have quality on them. Every single day that I'm afforded, because, and then I fucked off a lot of days. So I don't have time at this late stage to fuck off any more days. Yeah. Man, a day, to, for me today, that I'm able to live and it's got to have quality about it. That's you know? Cool. And so, yeah, so it's just like things that I know over the, over, by experience, you know, cause the quality of my day to be low. Like drugs and alcohol, got to get this shit out of my out of my path, and uh, you know because that's what it did. It's proven to me to be a negative element, you know, over the course of my day, you know. And drug, I, I thought I didn't think alcohol would be, but it turned out to be. Like Damn. oh shit, wow. Damn. No, that that's what's funny I because it was alcohol. it was the same situation for me, but I was on heroin. Uh, I was doing heroin right, and the right. crutch, and then yeah, got so off. Yeah, so my fiance, my fiance was on heroin as well. Yep, you just fucking. Yeah. I went from one to the next, and 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 then alcohol is what actually did me the worst. Like it, it fucked me over the worst yeah. in life. Like it's always so. Right. I'm seven years clean now, but my god, it took yeah. me a long time to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> it, it just took it took the time it took, man. But I'm glad. I'm glad, man. When I look at it in retrospect. I'm glad it. I'm glad I went through everything I went through. Mm. I'm glad it took the time it took. I'm glad I'm where I am today, man. I've got fucking information now. Hell yeah, hell I've, yeah. I've got information, man. That that you know, for myself, you know, I can move forward now with some information, you know, based on my experience. You know, that shit gives me the information now to know which what I can and can't do. What's going to be a wise choice and what's going to be a fucked up negative choice, you know? And there is no gray area. Is it going to work or it ain't going to work? It's either going to be cool or it's going to be fucked up. Right. You know, I've, I've, I have not found my drug experience that was in a gray area place where, okay, it ain't, it's not cool, but it's not fucked up. Yeah. It's right in the middle. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I I don't I, it, it don't work out that way for me. Yeah, yeah. No off and switch. Now, and then, yeah, yeah. And and and, and it, it has never worked out. Where it's okay. Wow, that was cool. That was okay. <laughs> not not in you know it, it was cool in the eighties, man. I used to have some cool, you know, early early free basing days in the early days of free base. We used to wake up and you know, you know, be okay. Yeah. But man, it it turned into crack and it, it the it turned into a whole other thing, man. And it really, I'm talking about for a 20 year run, it never was cool. I'm like, man, why do I keep doing this? And then my and then I found like that I you know, and I've I've discovered I had some mental issues. Mm -hmm. I never knew it. I never thought about it, but there was some 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 internal issue unaddressed and un unrecognized that caused me because I'm not a guy that had real reason to self destruct. You know, some people have a fucked up ass life, and oh, well, they have fucked up predicaments place. You know that they've you know like their upbringing and their childhood and you know molestation and. You know, they they had some horrible scenarios presented to them that make it almost understandable right. that they would veer. Me, man, my life, my entire life, I'm talking about from childhood, everything, man, it's been wonderful, man. I had nothing but great examples, wow. nothing but great environment. Never no bullshit that my parents put in front of me. I never had, you know... No, no, no bad influences, no bad experiences, no rapes, no molestations, 
no, you know, nothing. Mm. It was just like something as I became an adult, and, I, and it stemmed even further, even in my adolescence. I didn't like about Cornelius Mims. I didn't like me. There's something that I didn't love about myself and felt that I did not really deserve or felt like I was subpar yeah. as a man. I felt less than, and that's what drove me to self-destruct and not care about myself. And everybody else, on the other hand, loves the hell out of Corny Mims. Yeah. Everybody loves Corny I'm like a guy that everybody loves, but it still don't matter if Corny Mims don't love Corny Mims. For sure. So I had to figure out how to how to do that, how to you know how to really really despite your fucking short ass fingers that people you know you got this fucking extreme you know that shit used to really plague me my hand size uh-huh. because it's abnormally small. I mean, as a bass player too, people are constantly always how the fuck do you do it, man? You, you fucking fingers, you got fucking you know how you do it. Man, I don't know how I do it. I just do it. It just, you know, see, that that's what I'm saying. Why are you tripping, dude? <laughs> you're able, you're you're revered as one of the best bass players around. Fuck this, your finger size, man. Don't let that, you know. So what? Yeah, it's not stopping nothing. You know, it's not stopping anything. Why do you fucking crack out over something as stupid as that, and you can't even control it? And it's not even causing you issue. I can see it. if you, you couldn't, you know, if it caused you to not be able to perform or succeed or excel, man, you're the man. You're the fucking man. Everybody you know reveres you as a man. Stop fucking doing this to yourself. Find love for self. And that's what I've kind of done in these last 10 years, man. I'm like, man, I don't give a damn. I'm going to love me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm totally. gonna love me. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give a shit about me. Oh yeah, man. That, and, and 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 that's kind of the thing that has happened here in these last ten. And I, I really do care about myself. That's beautiful, man. And I think you that's know? a great place to so uh, to sort of end on uh, on this. That's sure. a, you know you fucking yeah, no doubt. corny Mims loves himself. That's a beautiful. That's I love me, man. <laughs> well, uh, well, Mr. Yeah, Mims, you know, and, 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 you know, honestly, there's you know that it's. It's a cool thing. No, Corny Mims is cool. No, I, I no, I'm a, I'm actually going through that same thing right now. So when you say no these doubt, things, it, it's it's resonating very hard with me because I'm in therapy I'm now, and um, yeah, you know, I'm 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 really like there, I even meditate. When I meditate, I say I love myself yeah. so I can love other people. That's it. And um, yeah. You know, because if you, you're right, if you don't love yourself, how can you even have the capacity to truly love other people or accept other you people's can't love? love? Nobody, man, and that's what's happening, man. I was not able to love uh, beyond myself because I didn't love myself. Yeah. So my relationships would never end. I would crack out and I would destroy these great women that I've ever in my life mm-hmm. because you know they'd see this sweet guy and all of a sudden out of nowhere. Uh, seemingly unprovoked, he would just crack out, and I would destroy myself and destroy the, you know. So it was it was just problematic, man, on a, on a lot of levels. So right, right now, man, my my fiance now, um, eleven years clean from heroin, you know, and mm-hmm. she works as a recovery coach now. Oh, okay. And she's got a great thing, man. I love Gloria and everything that she represents. She's hardcore sobriety, man, mm-hmm. and I love it. You know, it, it, you know. She's a super motivator for me, and I'm trying to be the same for her. That's incredible, So, man. you know, yeah, it's good stuff, man. Well, what are you working on right yeah. now, then, musically? What, what's what's going on with you musically now? Musically, right now, man, I've got, you know, um, again, now, uh, we, we kind of touched on, and I'd love to end on this, because this sure, is like, please. of all, all the things that I've done, this is the accolade, man, that, you, you know, you kind of strive for. You know, right for, and that's fantastic, Negrito. Oh yeah, it's fan. I mean, he's incredible. Incredible, and we have won our second Grammy Award. <sighs> Congratulations, man! And now, are you getting? Are you yeah, writing with him? Or are you? Are, are you touring? What? How involved are you? With- you know, I'm, 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 I'm. Firstly, I'm the guy on both of the, on anything Negrito recording wise. I'm okay. going to be the bass player. And, 
Yeah, I'm going to do all the projects. Nice. And then, you know, we're all somewhat of a, a, a creative um, creative force within that project. You know, so myself, a guy named Masa Kohama, guitarist, um, Xavier DeFrepelez, LJ Holeman, keyboard player. You know, we're kind of like the, the, the squad. Mm-hmm. That is fantastic to degree, though. And um, we we won um, the Best Contemporary Blues um, Grammy two years ago for the first album, which is called The Last Days of Oakland. And then we came up with another project and last year that ended up winning the same category this year. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. Well, this is two Grammy, two two projects, two Grammys. How did you, uh, you know? How did you link up with him? Man, it was more than it was fifteen years ago in Los Angeles. Oh shit! <laughs> and I don't, I don't remember what was the conduit, what was the connecting element for Xavier DeFrepelez and myself. Mm. He had a studio in L.A. and he was kind of churning out music and doing. And um, I met him. I came to his studio started doing bass sessions for him. And what I noticed about him was this dude is extremely unique and clever. Mm-hmm. I like him, his musical mind. I was very impressed with him. So, and he's got an ethic that I'd like. He never stops working, never stops creating, never stops, you know, grinding. Yeah. And, and he was an inspiration to me, a life inspiration too, because now, He's um, in his early fifties now, you know. So he stayed the course, and we and, and and when it's all said and done, here we are, two Grammys later, man. Because of really because of him, wow. you know, he's a visionary, man. So that is what I'm. We're getting ready to start a new Negrito project, um, the third album. We're getting ready to get going on that one pretty soon. Um, I'm also touring with another blues guitarist. That is the dopest. This dude's name is Dennis Jones. Okay. And we're the Dennis Jones band, man. And so you're in Toledo, right? Yes, sir. I am. Man, if we, you know, I'm hoping we can start doing some dates in the Midwest. If Dennis Jones gets in that area, man, I'm gonna. And, and again, I gotta figure what figure out the proximity of Toledo to Indianapolis, which is where I'm four getting hours. ready to relocate. It's like three hours. Is it four hours? It's like three, three to four, four hours. hours. It ain't shit. It's like okay, me. Okay, yeah, man. We gotta. I mean, I want to connect with you, man. I'd oh, love sure. to connect that space. Me, you, and Gloria, maybe your wife, and hang out, man, because you know we we move around. You know, we we, we me and Gloria get around. Like we get into. I know we go to. Um, um, she goes into Columbus and um, um, other parts, Cincinnati. You know, Gloria's in Columbus and Cincinnati all the time. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. Oh, yeah, man. My yeah, we are too. We're the same way. My wife is. Uh, we she's a singer as well, and, but she. Uh, oh, great, man. She um she does acting now, great. and she does modeling. Oh, good, man. So she's everywhere doing everything. Yeah. We're actually going to be in Chicago Ooh. tomorrow. So. Yeah, we oh, get great, around, man. Great, yeah, please. Great. I mean, I'd love to link up. I'd love to just you know. Yeah, man. Shit, we man. we got. I'd love to do it, man. Right, I mean, well, I'd I, love to do it. Man. I really appreciate, I really appreciate you taking the time, and especially, I know we went a little bit past an hour and a half, but like, I really appreciate okay, you putting you know, in I'll the time and and uh, you know, yeah. chatting with me, man. We got to do it, man. We got to do Yeah. Let's, hey, man, can you share the link to me to this podcast? Absolutely. This is probably going to come out either tonight or tomorrow. I, I'm uh, I'm kind of behind on my <laughs> releases, actually. Okay, do your thing. Whenever you get it up, whenever you get it up, let me even share it to me. I will most definitely do that. No doubt, man. Well, well Mike, man, this has been great, man. I'm I, glad we got it done. Me too, me too. I really appreciate it, man. Well, you have a fantastic no. rest of your day. And, and again, I, up, I'm man? totally down to stay connected and let's link. Okay, let's do it, man. Let's, let's, let's stay in communication. Awesome, man. All right, you have a good day. My man. You have a great one, man. All right. Okay, Mike. Bye. Take it easy. Love it. Well, there you go. Cornelius Mims. Uh, I really appreciate Cornelius for coming on, or or Mr. Mims, I should say. <laughs> I really appreciate Mr. Mims' time. He uh, he gave more than uh, than I asked for. So 
very much appreciated. And uh, and then he asked me for dinner and stuff. So that's very much an honor, which I will be following up on that. So thank you, Mr. Mims. Of course, I want to have dinner with the guy who was like programming those amazing drums on <laughs> on bad and work alongside Quincy Jones. And hated Toothpac, <laughs> which is the best fucking thing in the world. He hated Tupac. Um, but you know what? That's how it goes. That's how it goes sometimes. Uh, okay, so before you click off, uh, go to rainamystique.com, R-E-I-N-A-M-Y-S-T-I-Q-U-E. There you can find the new album, 1018. I had the honor of penning a couple of songs alongside my beautiful wife. Uh, we're very proud of it. You can find it on Spotify or anywhere you get your music digital music you can also get physical copies of anywhere we play by and, and you can find that out by hitting the experience tab on the website raymystique.com anyways uh write the show at we speak english good at gmail.com let us know what you think of this episode what did you, what did you think about him saying that he wished he killed tupac that shit was hilarious oh shit um Oh, no, he said uh, he wanted to or something. Anyways, I, I'm sure I'm misquoting him, and I just talked to him. <laughs> uh, yeah, let us know what you think about those comments. Uh, I mean, I, he was very forthcoming, I think. And, 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 you know, you guys, anybody who's been following this show for any amount of time knows that I I very much wanted, like, to talk about the mental health side of music. And for you know, a musician of this caliber who still is, who's still winning Grammys and shit. It's not like he ever stopped. Um, you know, it's, it, it's good to hear it from, from people who've accomplished so much. It's good to hear about how, you know, a man can fall from grace and, and still lift himself back up, man or woman. I'm just saying, man. <laughs> but you know like the human capacity to to overcome is is great and uh i, I just I, I think that that's very inspiring for people who might be you know suffering out there and and that's why i tell these stories and i say this over and over again uh i know i sometimes glorify my drug use and like how and, and it's part of the narrative here but in reality it's a very empty pursuit drugs um uh, depending on how you use them, of course. I mean, if you're using them medically or whatever, <laughs> whatever excuse you're using, uh, <laughs> you know, th there's a difference. There's a difference between using mind-altering substances for in medicinal purposes and, uh, you know, just being reckless, you know. And, uh, you know, that, that shit, it's a hole, man. It's a trap. And I've been there. I've done that. It's, I'm not interested in it. It's in like, to, I'm so not interested to being addicted that I am, I'm, I'm so close to quitting coffee because I've become so addicted to this shit, man. Like I, I know I'm drinking several pot. I have a Keurig, not to sound elitist or anything with my Keurig, but I have a Keurig and I, uh, I fucking drink, I don't know, I, I wake up with two pods, like, right off the bat, 2K cups straight down the fucking face, that's not good, you shouldn't be waking up and fucking hitting your system with fucking amphetamines, Jesus Christ, <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, you know, like, and I've been honestly thinking about, uh, speaking of amphetamines, I've been thinking about treating my adult ADHD, um, and that's all the treatment is, is amphetamines. They want to give me fucking, uh, what, what is the Adderall? No, I, I'm on coffee all fucking day. I don't need to be all fucking tweet. Oh my God. That, that just sounds awful, but shit. I forgot what I was even talking about. Christ. Yeah, I, I I just got done talking to Cornelius and 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 I stepped out and had lunch, smoked a bowl with my wife and now I'm back here rambling on about fucking Adderall. Anyways, uh, yeah. So uh, I think it's important for for to to repeat these stories for people so they could see that it's not just you know it's not just a temporary thing either. Uh, Cornelius. 
for 15, 20 years was fighting this monkey off his back. And, you know, for me, it was about the same amount of time, honestly, because I was doing drugs frequently from age like 18 until 30, uh, like hard drugs and alcohols and stuff. And even before them, and my God, I've been drugged since I was a child. They gave me speed. I was riddling when I was on that seven. And, you know, you take anything consistently. I mean, I know that was my medication, but you become addicted to that shit. And then in the summers, my parents didn't care if I ate Ritalin. They were like, fuck it. He's the babysitter's problem now. (laughs) So, and that's not how my parents raised me at all, by the way. (laughs) They weren't like, oh, he's the babysitter's problem. Fuck you. But, yeah, I I mean, I I had a monkey on my back for a really long time, too. And and that's why caffeine is kind of freaking me out because I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I get headaches and, um, you know, I feel horrible. I'm grouchy and I don't like not being able to control my own emotions because I already have a hard time doing that anyways. It's like I already have a hard time uh, not being a fucking angry psychopath. So it's it, it doesn't help. And, oh God, you add speed to that, and I don't like it. I don't like it. it, it caffeine is speed. Caffeine is a drug. Uh, my mom... <laughs> My mom would tell me, my mom says it over and over again. It's like, I'm not addicted to coffee. I was like, so what happens if you don't have coffee? I get a headache. I was like, that's withdraw, okay? And you even say, if I don't drink coffee, I get a headache. That's fucking withdraw. It's withdraw. Okay, so, sorry, mom. (laughs) Thank God she doesn't know how to listen to these things. Unless she does. Oh, my God. I've thought about that before. If my mom actually does listen to this shit... And she just doesn't tell me because that's the kind of mom she is. She'll like find some shit out about you. Well, she won't say nothing. You know, she ain't going to break the, the, you know, break the rules. She knows that it's unspoken of. It's un- <laughs> Which is probably part of the problem. But I love my mom. So there's no problem there. Anyways. Uh, yeah. So I repeat myself a lot. And I don't want to glorify these things in a way that to, that makes it inspiring for young guys to go out there be like yeah it's a party and fucking let's do it but i mean but then again i do feel like in your 20s you know like you should be fucking free you should be able to do things it's just i mean you gotta be able to go to the edge man you gotta jump off the you gotta take that leap man one way or another you gotta take that leap and if it's not through drugs and it's not through experience i don't know it has to be through something I mean, you have to, like, to truly, I don't know, man. I feel like to truly pursue your path, you have to, you have to take a leap over the edge, man. Or else you're just going to be repeating the same bullshit over and over again. But, yeah, the drug aspect, uh, I really appreciate when artists talk about that. And I really appreciate it when they're willing to, you know, divulge that kind of information because that's very vulnerable information. You know, no one wants to admit their weaknesses or their vulnerabilities, especially ones that are preventable, like drug addiction. It's, it's a hard thing for some people to talk about. So it's a hard thing, but most things we're talking about are kind of hard to talk about, you know, like truth is hard. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, I wanted to address this whole fucking recorder situation. I do apologize for the technical issues in this, uh, in this episode because it was just, uh, we would be getting these good parts and it would stop. (laughs) And and I'd be like, Oh my God. And, And one time I told him, I was like, Hey, um, you know, hold on, my computer's acting like an asshole, and uh, we were able to, I cut it together, I think it sounds okay, and I didn't want to lose any of the, the, the content of it, there are, I did edit it, I don't, as you guys know, I don't like to edit much, unless my guest wants me to, or unless it's just absolutely necessary, because I say something stupid, which I have done that. I've totally taken out stupid things I've said. <laughs> I just took out something stupid I said. But I did find myself editing out um, some, like, nonsense thing that I was just sort of, like, some, uh, whoa, what do you call them? I was just saying something about myself, which was unnecessary, which kind of uh, interrupted the flow of what Cor- Corny was talking about. 
Mr. Mims, <laughs> what Mr. Mims was talking about. And, uh, you know, like it, it kind of was like a realization. I know I do this a lot, but like sometimes I'll just interject and break up the flow of things. <laughs> and, uh, and for, for just to talk about myself. And so I cut that shit out. So I was just letting you guys know that I did edit some stuff out while I was going through this episode. I edited some shit out because I thought it was just stupid. Like I didn't, the, it added nothing. So you're not missing out. It's still pretty much uncut, but I did have to like cut it in certain ways that make made it make sense with the the narrative, you know? So he's talking and then, you know, I can't just jump into a totally different subject altogether. Um, so th- if you did hear some hard cuts, uh, my apologies. I think it ran as pretty smoothly. I probably didn't even need to address it, but it kind of leads to the recording, the recorder situation, which, okay. So in the last episode, I was talking about leaving my fucking recorder in Phoenix and, uh, I still haven't gotten it back. And, uh, you know, I've been, I've been in contact with J rock, you know, J rock live, go check them out. Uh, and, uh, he has it. Thank God. He was able to get it from the venue, uh, last exit live, which is an amazing venue. And if you're a touring band, I definitely, uh, suggest going and reaching out to them because it's a great venue and they take good care of you. And so, uh, they ended up getting the recorder to J rock. And so J rock has it and, uh, he's just been busy. So he hasn't been able to send it. That makes me uneasy because there's three podcasts on there. And to be honest, those podcasts are amazing to me. Like, I I don't know how much you guys are going to find them amazing. But for me, they were like amazing conversations. And it's it's another bootleg show. But uh, but it's still, I, oh, man, the content means everything to me. But the recorder was such an amazing tool and uh, so I had to kind of switch over to, I had to go out and buy a, uh, a, a, a power adapter for my Scarlett 6i6 Focusrite uh, interface. <laughs> oh my God. I had to do so much to get this going because without that recorder, I'm, I'm so fucking angry. So I had to depend on my MacBook, which MacBooks are dependable, but my shit is so full and the, and the, and the RAM is so low that it just stops because the disc was too slow to write. It couldn't catch up. So, uh, oh my God. And, and the morning that I had <laughs> that preceded uh, the, the, the interview, also I had to run out and buy stuff because I lost my dongle for my fucking iPhone because the fucking iPhone requires a dongle to as an adapter to plug into your fucking, <laughs> to like a stereo or something. It's very annoying. Very annoying thing that Apple did. But whatever, I'm still going to buy everything that Apple puts out. Well, not everything, but, you know, I'm just beat. Whatever. Okay, so so I just sort of wanted to let you guys know where what what happened there. So also, uh, you know, so I, I, I had to record on my MacBook, and it stops all the fucking time. The thing about the Zoom H4n is that it's just, it's a workhorse, man. That fucking shit, like... I dropped it on its microphone and the fucking thing still records like a dream. It's loose and shitty. <laughs> the microphone is, but, but it's still, it works beautiful. Uh, I, I've never had a problem with it losing information. Uh, I've never had a problem with it, uh, you know, just deleting files for no reason. I've never had a problem with it fucking just stopping in the middle of a fucking, you know, just like, oop, I stopped recording. Never had any problem. And I use that fucking thing like almost every week, a few times a week. And it's it's not. I mean, like, you know, if you're a musician, which you probably are, if you're listening to this, you're probably a musician. Uh you know how hard it is fucking taking those things out on the road and take, you know, gear gets fucked up out there and that thing just has taken a licking and keeps on ticking and well, gee, golly darn it. I really want it back. <laughs> so, uh, there, that's where we stand on that. And, and I just sort of wanted to fill you guys in on why I, I know I mentioned something before the interview about this and I wanted to address it 
Well, that's it for now, guys. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Mr. Mims. I know I certainly did. Uh, it was fantastic. And I, I just want to remind everybody that the 200th episode is right around the corner. We got a few more episodes left until we're there. And, and the good times are only getting better. I got some great, great, great guests coming up, uh, including the 200th episode, which is the mystery guest, which is already in the can. It's waiting to be released because... Well, it is uh, because I because it was fun because <laughs> it's fun to have mystery. Right. Anyways, uh, I, I I do got to say that this is one for the books that this this conversation and the, the what we were talking about and the gravity and the impact that one human being can have on in the entire world. Um, you know, that's sort of what this was to me. Um, I hope it was to you as well. Um, but yeah, the 200th episode guess is fire too. So it, it's getting better folks. Um, I got some cats out of the Arizona we're going to talk to that I met on tour. And, uh, if J rock ever sends me my recorder, uh, we'll have a uh, summer tour SRP also to look forward to as well. So Whenever that gets here and uh, whatever comes first. So we're uh, if you guys haven't noticed, this is Friday that I'm releasing this. So the next episode, I'm going to get back onto my Wednesday routine with a brand new guest. Um, who's it going to be? It's going to be Ziki Keeley. And he is, uh, well, they're a band out of Tucson, Arizona. We played with them actually at, uh, at uh, the last exit. Um, and w so they're going to be the next, next episode. And then who's after that? Oh yes. And then, uh, a new friend that I met through Byron Harris Jr., which you guys love Byron. He has like 5,000 hits. <laughs> he, uh, uh, it, I met him through, uh, Byron at, uh, at a gig and, uh, his name is Garrett and he is an incredible, incredible guitar player and his awesome, I think it's his wife or his fiance. They, uh, I think your name's Shay Rain. So they're gonna be after that, and then it's the. I think it's the. That's the 200th. Then wait a second. What is it? I think this is 196. That'll be 197, 198. Oh shit! I still have one more. So I don't know who's coming after that. Maybe I'll have my recorder by then, and we can start releasing some of the lost footage from the SRP Summer Tour 2019. Pew pew pew. Okay, guys, I'm for real Get the fuck out of here. I had a lot to say, so I'm glad it's at the end. All right, guys, I'll see you guys next week. Take care of your fellow human beings. HJs for everybody. Okay. <laughs>